Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending the uh, March 3rd, 2022 Sustainability Commission meeting. Uh, meetings are broadcast live on Glendale TV, viewable on Spectrum Cable Channel 6 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. Uh, meetings are also streamed live in high definition on the city's webpage at glendaleca.gov. Um, Glendale slash live on youtube.com slash my glendale and on apple tv roku and amazon fire devices using a free app called screenweave and choosing glendale tv from the menu uh, meetings are also archived on the city website for viewing at any time at glendaleca.gov slash agendas uh, Call 818-548-4013 for program schedules. Uh, DVDs of the proceedings are available for purchase in the city clerk's office. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, if you have any questions, oh, should I be reading this or should I scroll down, guys? You're good. Not for you if you would like. Yes, you can read it. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, matters on the agenda, or requests for assistance, please contact the Management Services Office at 818-548-4844 during regular business hours. Um, to help slow the transmission of COVID-19 and protect the health and safety of the community, City Council, as well as Board and Commission meetings, uh, we will continue to be closed to the public for in-person attendance. Uh, the public is encouraged to watch and participate from the safety of their homes to practice social distancing. Meetings are broadcast live on Glendale TV, viewable on Spectrum, Cable, Channel 6, at t Uverse, Channel 99. Um, for public comments and questions during the meeting, call 818-937-8100. Public comments on a specific agenda item will be taken when that agenda item is discussed. And with that, let's get started with the agenda. I'm going to conduct a roll call. Commissioner Hanjan. Here, sorry about that. Commissioner Kartunyan. Present. Commissioner Pinkerton. Present. Vice Chair Werner? Here. Chair Bartusov? Here. Ex Official Gang? Here. Ex Official Prado? Present. Thank you. Item, uh, item 1A, Pledge of Allegiance. All right. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. Of, of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item 1B The agenda for March 3, 2022 meeting of the Sustainability Commission was posted on February 28, 2022, on the bulletin board outside City Hall. Item number two, approval of minutes. 2A, approval of minutes of the commission regular meeting held on February 3, 2022. May I please have a motion and second? So moved. Second. And minutes are approved as submitted. Next on the agenda, under item three, 3A, commendation to Clark Magnet High School to team CMCH4 for winning in NASA Take Rise Student Challenge. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, staff, do you, what, would you like to uh, kick us off and then I'll, I'll make some comments at the end? Sure. Thank you, Chairman Batrasouf. Um, I'd like to invite um, the faculty and students from Clark Magnet High School to give a brief presentation on this project and, their, and how they were involved in the project. Uh, Dominique, you're muted. 
Sorry, I needed to share my screen so you guys can see what they did. They wrote this beautiful proposal and I hardly had to edit it at all. I was very impressed with the writing. They uh, outlined what their experiment would be, why they wanted to do the experiment, and then backed it up with evidence from mapping because I, I teach a GIS and remote sensing class. So this project was split between the environmental GIS course and the GIS and remote sensing class. So they wanted to study the amount of um, methane and volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere over places that had oil and gas wells. We were, we were, um, you know, we were inspired by the Porter Ranch gas blowout and we wanted to do a little monitoring there. But this proposal is for a high altitude balloon that will fly over oil and gas fields in South Dakota. So we split it in two, one as a proof of concept project here locally for the GIS and remote sensing team. And the other half is for the environmental GIS team that's gonna send their experiment to South Dakota. So we made maps not only locally, but also did a suitability analysis for the fields in South Dakota. And then one of the students made a 3D model of, of their what they're going to build. They came up with milestones and dates. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gabriella first, when, and she could tell her part in the project, and we'll just go down the line, and the kids could tell us what they've done and what their next steps are. Gabriella? Hi, so um, I helped in choosing our project and writing up our what and why part of the proposal, which is what Miss Evans already went over. It was to launch a high altitude balloon to detect uh, methane and volatile organic compound levels and um, map it out for us. And Danny did something else for, if you can. Uh, yeah, so with the mapping, uh, that's the part that I did, me and another student, Matthew, who couldn't make it today, but we pretty much mapped out all the oil wells in uh, in South Dakota area so that we could plan where we want to fly the balloon. And um, that's what I did. And I also planned all the dates and gave us our team a timeline for when to complete each step of our project. How about Sam? My section of the project was sort of a link between the two, where I was part of the proof of concept team as well as the TechRise proposal team. I did most of the modeling for the TechRise proposal team, so we can show a physical model of what our satellite parts look like. And for the proof of concept team, I was working mostly on creating the satellite as well as doing calculations for wind speed and direction so that we can get accurate measurements. And my friend Miko can tell you about how we did our mapping. Uh, so yeah, as Sam stated, me and Sam both worked on the proof of concept together and I was able to map the location where we want to carry out our experiment as well as um, data regarding where we're allowed to fly no-fly zones where we can actually have uh, uh, permission to fly our balloon and collect the data that we need mm -hmm. and using the math that Sam came up with and the equation, we would be able to predict where our balloon will land and the path that it will take with the given wind speeds in order to be able to predict where we can, uh, where it will land and we will be able to retrieve our balloon. Oh, is that everyone? Yeah. See if I can find that map for you. Oh, wait. Mikhail, do you have the map handy that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, the one that we present to Skills USA. Let me see if I can get it pulled up. Methane emissions? Oh, airspace for flying balloons. Oh, nice. What altitude did the balloon reach? We haven't done it yet. But Sam would know. What what altitude, Sam? <laughs> oh, 
we're hoping for something around about a mile in the area. Not a mile necessarily, but something around that distance, maybe a mile and a half, just to get accurate measurements while remaining sure. in the wind to allow us to travel in the direction of the most amount of methane. Here's one of the maps Mikhail made. And this is showing he's mapped. Well, tell us, Mikhail, what you've mapped. Tell us what's going we, on. Uh, yeah, so with the data that we gathered from, um, I believe it was, uh, Sam, help me out here. Where do we get our data from? Regarding the gas leaks. We got our data from, partial, partial data is from NASA from 2015, which reported yeah. the gas okay. leaks. And the other data we found from uh, the National Weather Association for the wind speeds. Yeah. And the so no-fly zones were provided by the ESRI organization. Yeah, so uh, the data that we got from NASA included the uh, gas leaks. And so when we uh, graphed those, when I graphed those gas leaks, I had to also graph the no-fly zone since there's airports nearby, including like the Van Nuys Airport, because we have we have to be able to fly and collect our data without, you know, breaking any laws. Or if there's any extra steps or permits that we need to acquire, we need to know uh, do that beforehand. So we will be able to do complete this uh, experiment from start to finish. And so clearly um, you can see that uh, the gas wells here, they actually fall outside of the zones, which is the turquoise on the bottom right of the screen of Miss Evans. And therefore, we would be able to ca carry out our experiment without any further uh, permits that we had to acquire. Question for the team. Do you have to retrieve the balloon afterwards to get the data, or is that transmitted um, via, you know, frequency? Yeah, uh, that's Radio. a very good question. Uh, Sam's actually... Uh, yeah, playing a big part in building the answer, chipset yeah. by itself. For that go situation, ahead. we have a GPS on board, which will actually track the flight path of our balloon. So if we do lose it, we always have that as a fail safe. But okay. using a calculation for the wind speed and the predicted flight time with the regards to the helium in the balloon, we can accurately determine within a mile radius of where our balloon is going to land. But we also have a FM radio signal, which would send back and relay the data to a ground station we will have set up. Okay. Thank you. One quick question. Do you, can you speculate or do you know if the methane emissions are from equipment links or does the methane just seep through the ground into the atmosphere? Well, uh, Sam, you want to answer or? Uh, a big part of the reason we wanted to carry this out was to track the development of the methane emissions since the blowout. And since there's no recent data on the internet, if you actually search the data that we have uh, graphed is from 2015, what will we, be, we what will we be able to do is collect data from 2022 and track the progress of this data and to see if these emissions have increased or decreased and how it would affect the people that live nearby. Right. Where's your story map, Mikhail? Which one is it? I think Marat made the story map, so you probably want to look at Marat. Oh, okay, okay. These guys also presented this project at Skills USA, and they they got they medaled at Skills USA, and they're going on to compete at the state level. Congratulations! Thank you. Why is there no more recent data available online? Is it because of litigation? Uh, I'm not quite sure, but we spend a while looking for data, you know, to be able to get the most recent data, and right. we wanted to do. A change over time but with the lack of data we kind of shifted our project towards uh finding aggression over time because we weren't able to find more recent data so that's kind of that that was the question that we were asking why is there no more recent data so we shifted towards kind of that experiment design michael have you checked with aqmd air quality management district uh we have not and uh, the big i think a big reason for that is because you know, we haven't carried out this fight yet. So once we get closer okay. to that, we're going to be able to follow those checklists. Um, my recommendation would be to check with the South Coast Air Quality Management District. If anybody's going to have uh, qualitative data, it's going to, in this area, in this particular topic, it's, it has to be AQMD. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, our balloon, our balloon will be going way higher than AQMD has data on the, okay. they're more ground level. Okay. Um, Miguel, you want, want to 
Mikhail, you want to talk to us about what we're looking at here? Uh, yeah, so what we have uh, graphed here, I believe, is the two specific gas leaks and the locations that we want to cover with our balloon flight. And the uh, purple that you see is the Puma emissions of methane that we've graphed. So, and like the, the size of the radius actually uh, represents the magnitude of it. So, uh, and this data, if Ms. Evans goes, clicks on it, I think, it's, I believe it's from 2017. If you click on that purple, Ms. Evans, yeah. Clicking. Oh, it's not interactive. Okay. So the data is from 2017. And what we'll be able to do is with the new data that we collect, uh, graph it on the same given map, and we will be able to compare the magnitude and the location of the emissions. And what I did, and I think I, if you can see the yellow arrows on the map, those are a lively updated uh, wind speeds. So as the, we get closer to our launch date, we will be able to use these wind speeds to actually predict the path and location where we should fly our balloon from and where we will land. Are there MET devices out there for the, is that where you're getting your wind speeds? Uh, using the Esri ArcGIS platform, I was able to uh, use their, it was their own uh, data regarding live uh, wind speed. So I was able to just add that layer on top, which allowed me it, and it updates over time. Yeah, it's no uh, National Weather Service. Okay. Where did you, the sensors that I assume you're using to detect the methane, did you have to develop those yourself or those sort of off the shelf I think Sam, yeah, Sam was more of on the hardware part of the experimental design, so he will be able to answer, to answer that, those questions. Yes, so all these yeah. uh, sensors we were collecting were sensors that we found compatible with the Raspberry Pi system that we are going to be using for the calculation and accumulation of our data. So most of these parts here were found online from uh, Adafruit website and as well as websites that support Raspberry Fruit, the Raspberry Pi uh, computer boards. And we're just going to use these sensors since they do collect a lot of data and are fairly cheap and very lightweight, which will be perfect for this uh, experiment. Sure. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. And they 3D printed a CubeSat frame to put it all together in. Yeah. Very good. So tell us about your medal. So they just meddled in the competition. Oh. Um, so our group with me, Sam, and also one of our friends, which wasn't able to make it here, we uh, got the bronze medal at the regional level, alongside with one of our other teams from our class that they actually got the gold medal and then another team that got fourth place. So all of us will be actually going to compete for state uh, later on the year. Congratulations. Great. Well, um, thank you all for being here. Um, the, the Sustainability Commission wants to congratulate Clark Magna students and uh, in the Environmental GIS and GIS and Remote Sensing Honors classes. Um, these out outstanding students won NASA's TechRise Student Challenge for the High Altitude Balloon Contest uh, by creating and flying a payload on a high altitude balloon to monitor gas and oil well commissions. Um, so emissions. So uh, the Sustainability Commission would like to commend your collective efforts in designing this innovative tool um, that'll help monitor and quantify emissions from these sources to better understand their impact on our environment. Um, definitely has come a long way since I was at Clark Magnet 20 years ago. Um, I know I know the highlight and the big ticket item during that time was robotics happy to see uh, so many initiatives on the sustainability front. Um, so congratulations on being leaders in advancing sustainability initiatives in our community. And we invite you when, when you all feel ready and, and are willing to serve on, on the Sustainability Commission, we encourage you to engage yourself in uh, local affairs as well. Uh, so thank you all and good luck to you on your future endeavors. And, uh, thank you to uh, staff at Clark Magnet as well for helping uh, shepherd these students along. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, all right. And uh, with that, shall we move on to our next agenda item? Next item, item number four, oral communications. Discussion is limited to items within the jurisdiction of the Sustainability Commission. Each speaker is allowed five I'm sorry, Vlad, if we could just go back to staff comments for a minute, please. Oh, 
Uh, uh, item number three, board members and staff comments. Um, thank you, Vlad. Um, chair Bartrasuf, um, if it pleases the chair, I would like to um, move agenda item 6A to follow um, board and staff comments. So CD staff can um, give us a presentation and not wait through the rest of our agenda. If that's okay with you? Yes, please, that's fine. And then secondly, um, before we move on, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth to um, the Sustainability Commission and other staff who are, are on this call. Um, Elizabeth recently joined us as our Sustainability Associate, so we're very, very happy and very excited to have her on board. Um, Elizabeth is a Glendale native who recently joined the Office of Sustainability as our new Sustainability Associate. She comes to us with a background in innovation, strategy, design, and digital marketing. She has an international background with pursuing her bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, coordinating a global innovation competition at an international electronics manufacturer and leading innovation projects at Accenture's global innovation center, the Dock in Ireland. Sustainability was a foundational passion of her work. She was awarded a sustainability award from the University of Edinburgh and won Accenture's Leaders of Tomorrow competition with a project on retail sustainability services for a utility. Since she has returned stateside two years ago and pivoted to a digital marketing and content strategy with a focus on sustainability. She led marketing efforts for a coaching startup and launched a digital magazine, Toasty Mag. In Toasty Mag, Elizabeth highlights issues of intersectional environmentalism, regenerative farming, business for good, and social sustainability, to name a few items. Now she comes to the Office of Sustainability to help us innovate for our residents, uplift and engage the unrepresented, and ensure that we bring a diverse group to the table for climate change action. So with that, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth. Thank you, David. It's wonderful to join the office and great to be here. Welcome. Hey, yes, thank you. I, I had the pleasure of meeting Elizabeth a few days ago. Uh, welcome to the team and on behalf of the commission, welcome to the city family. Looking forward to working with you. Thank you, looking forward to it as well. Um, any other staff comments? Nope. All right, uh, any commissioner comments? I just wondered if we could have a brief um, status update on what happened with the uh, Grayson power plant. So that was, that came before us last month. So it went to city council since then, right? I'm able to provide a short uh, update on that as I did attend both of those city council meetings. Um, and let me just uh, grab the date. So on, let's see. On February uh, 22nd, the city council certified the uh, final environmental impact report and um, approved alternative seven, which is the environmentally superior alternative uh, that was studied um, along with the project. Uh, on Tuesday night, uh, during that, that uh, meeting, um, council member Brotman uh, made a motion seconded by council member Najarian to come back and to consider uh, some additional um, concerns with the uh, implementation of the Wartzilla engines and other activities that could be undertaken um, along the lines of exploring um, further um, demand response um, and distributed energy resources, among other sorts of renewable resource options. That um, item came back in the form of a resolution on Tuesday night and uh, was supported unanimously without going into details of, of all of the items that were discussed. And in essence, what it uh, uh, recommends is that uh, staff continue 
as I indicated, exploration of certain uh, clean energy and renewable alternatives. At the same time, it rolls out and implements alternative seven, uh, uh, which includes the uh, Tesla uh, Power Island uh, and the Wartzilla engines. So do all of the preliminary work for that and to come back prior to, well, and report to the council on an interim basis and ultimately a decision overall concerning the implementation of the Wartzilla engines would be made before the end of this calendar year. So that's a, a rough summary of the items that were discussed. Hopefully that's a sufficient off the top uh, status report. No, thank you. I, I knew a piece of it was going back this past Tuesday and I didn't have time to watch the whole thing. So thank you for that. You're, you're welcome. And the resol the final resolution um, should be available on the city's website. Uh, that would be executed by by the mayor um, with the reflecting the votes on the resolution um, within the next few days. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the update. Any other commissioner comments? All right, seeing none, let's uh, move on to the next item. Next item is requested report on the reports and information 6A, departmental information session, community development. Uh, good afternoon, um, Chairman Bahadur and commissioners. Uh, we'd like to welcome staff from community development here today who are gonna present to the commission on a lot of the work that they have been done and are going to be doing in the future. Um, this is going to be one of two meetings um, from community development. Um, tonight's meeting is primarily going to focus on their planning role and their plans, what they're currently doing. Um, future meetings will look more at policy and housing and other issues that the commissioners did bring up. All those questions and areas of concern that the commissioners did bring up, we did forward to community development, so they will be able to respond um, to your questions, either this meeting or the next meeting. And with that, I'd like to ask Mr. Cooper, Calvert, sorry, to um, take it away. I thought we knew each other better than that, Dave. Sorry, sorry Bradley. <laughs> uh, thank you, Commission members. Um, as, as highlighted, we're here to uh, give you an overview of some of the long range planning initiatives that, that we have going on. Um, what we're not going to be covering today, though, will be things like uh, building code, energy code, things like that. That's going to be coming to you at a future date. Um, this is really focused on kind of long range planning initiatives, um, things related to community plans, uh, mobility, uh, parks and open space, urban design, things of that nature, just kind of setting that table, if you will. Um, let me share my screen here. <clears throat> so we have a number of, <clears throat> excuse me, initiatives that, that are moving forward, some that just got underway, um, some that are going to be going through some revisions, uh, some that have just been adopted. Um, so as I mentioned, we're, what, we're, what we'd like to start with here is, is discussing mobility. Um, and that's really looking at our bicycle transportation plan. Um, the existing plan that is in place was adopted in October of 2012. Uh, that is clearly a, a relatively long time ago, uh, 10 years uh, actually. And, and the focus of this plan was really on class two and class three bicycle facilities. Um, what that means is uh, class one is, an, is a protected separated facility. Uh, something like the Los Angeles River Trail, something that does not share the right of way with with motorist. A class two is an unprotected bicycle lane, one that does not have some sort of physical barrier separation uh, from moving traffic, but is also located within the right of way. Um, a class three is what we consider sharrows. That's actually in the, the the photograph that you see there to the right. Uh, it's a painted symbol on the road that that indicates that motorists are to share that space with cyclists. They do have a right to use that right of way. Uh, since the adoption of this plan, uh, Caltrans has adopted formal standards for what are considered class four bicycle facilities. Those are protected bicycle lanes that can be protected in a number of different ways. Uh, that can be done through curbs, that can be done through delineators and bollards, parked cars, but there's a physical separation between motorists and cyclists. Um, the existing bicycle transportation plan when it was created focused heavily as mentioned on, on class two and class three, but what that does is creates a less effective um, uh, 
environment for safe cycling. Uh, cycling for uh, users of all kind of comfort and experience levels. And that's not to say that the first bicycle plan, the, the, the 2012 edition, uh, was, was short in any way. That just happened to be, at that time, the kind of predominant means of creating bicycle infrastructure. Um, what we've learned is that since then, that doesn't create a safe environment for everyone. Uh, there have been changes in best practices, uh, which I'll, I'll comment on here in a minute. But that initial plan also included things like amenities, um, bicycle racks, shower facilities, wayfinding, uh, things of that nature to really try to start creating a, an, an efficient network across the city. Um, not so much focused on kind of discrete routes, but a network that, in, that connected employment centers to where people lived, uh, where people entertained themselves to, to create something that was meaningful. Um, this this illustrates the uh, rate of incidents uh, in the city of Glendale for for cyclists. Uh, you can see in 2012 we peaked in terms of of, of injuries. Uh, that number has gone down over time. Um, we do believe that has a lot to do with what was completed in terms of the 2012 bicycle transportation plan. Um, a lot of new routes were designated. Uh, you can look on Central and see a Class Two bicycle facility. You can see Class Three sharrows across the city. Um, uh, we have a handful of locations with protected bicycle lanes as well, uh, but we have seen an uptick in 2019, uh, some of the most recent data that, that we were able to accumulate for this meeting, um, showing that the number of injuries were going back up. <clears throat> and that can be for a number of different reasons, but what we've, we've been able to kind of glean from this and, and from council direction is that we should go back and update this bicycle transportation plan. Uh, it was a good start. It established a good foundation to identify routes, to identify linkages to activity centers and, and where people lived. Uh, but this could evolve and, and adapt in ways that are uh, more in line with best practices and current practices. So what the city council has done is they, they have directed staff to update this bicycle transportation plan. Uh, funding was provided through Measure S and then external sources as well uh, rounded that out to, to give us a, a really kind of robust budget to go back and update this plan. And the goal is to coordinate with recently adopted plans. Uh, as we'll touch on in a few moments, the city has adopted, uh, city council has adopted the citywide pedestrian plan. Um, and as I mentioned before, changes in best practices, and that's really kind of going to that class four bicycle lanes. Are there opportunities that we, we didn't identify in 2012, or as mentioned, as we move forward with best practices, are there better facilities that we could be creating? Um, we also have a number of other mobility related projects that are in the works. Uh, Metro BRT, Nohota Pasadena, uh, the Vertigo Watch, which we'll also touch on here this evening, uh, the Streetcar, which we'll, we'll also touch on this evening, all are, are really starting to create this very strong multimodal transportation environment. And right now is a good time for us to go back and update this, this bicycle transportation plan to make sure that it's speaking to all of these plans, um, all of these that are in the works, those that have been adopted, and again, really focused on, on kind of best practices as well. What it'll also do is help increase our access to active transportation funding. Uh, the image that you see to the right, this is part of the West Glendale Sustainable Transportation and Land Use Study. Um, that project really focused on creating a um, improved bicycle facility uh, along Glen Oaks in light of the Metro BRT project, but it also looked at some of the surrounding and adjacent streets on creating complete streets. Um, this is an example not far from Glen Oaks, as you can see a, a protected cycle track. Um, these projects, while some of them were discrete, will be folded into this plan. And the goal really will be to create a modern, equitable, and efficient uh, cycling network for the city. So really looking at that integration with other modes. Yes. What is Metro BRT? Uh, that's the bus rapid transit. Uh, there is a bus rapid transit line that will go from uh, North Hollywood to Pasadena. Uh, part of that route will use Glen Oaks Boulevard. Uh, it'll create a dedicated lane. Um, as to kind of capitalize on that opportunity, we had launched a study to look at improving those bicycle transportation facilities. Um, we are also very fortunate in, in regards that Metro has committed funding to realize uh, that plan, which uh, creates a protected bicycle lane on uh, on both sides, on Glen Oaks, as well as some of the adjacent streets to complete to create a complete streets network. Um, I had a question on the previous slide, hmm? the bar chart, uh, or maybe the one before that. This one? Yeah, there. Um, so I noticed the first several years didn't show fatalities. That Does that mean there weren't any or they weren't tracking them? No, we didn't have fatality data for those years. Uh, so you can see from 2012 to 2018, we did. We did not have it for 2019 either. So really kind of focusing on the, the injury and the total number. 
Yeah. So you'd probably want to mention that because otherwise it looks like, I mean, just reading the chart the way it is, um, that, you know, there were no fatalities until they came up with a bicycle plan and then there's all these fatalities. So, um, and, and also I would, um, I know it's the, there's big increments between like zero, 10, 20, all that, but um, so it's hard to tell looking at the green, how many people, I mean, since we're talking about people, maybe we have like a little number above each of those or something. So is 2012 was at two people and 2013 was three or three and five, you know, I just think that that would make the chart um, a little bit more reader friendly. Yep. And just noting that the data wasn't available before. <clears throat> Okay. So as mentioned, this updating this plan will will do a lot in terms of incorporating and integrating with other plans, uh, increasing funding opportunities to help us realize some of these projects as well. There are active transportation grants to be able to pursue and having this updated plan that incorporates things like complete streets um, that does coordinate with, with the other multimodal plans will, will, uh, will benefit the city in, in regards to implementation and not just planning. Uh, City staff just recently wrapped up the um, uh, recruitment process for a firm to to do the bicycle or update the bicycle transportation plan. Uh, that firm is Burrow Happel. Uh, they are actually a subconsultant team uh, for the Verdugo Wash Visioning Project, uh, but also bring a number of other individuals into that fold um, who are, are experts in bicycle transportation planning, many of which actually set some of the national standards that are used by the uh, National Association of City Transportation Officials. Uh, so we're very confident that we have a very strong, very well-versed team, one that actually is able to see through projects, not just in planning, but through implementation. Um, this is, we're looking at approximately an 18 month timeline once we wrap up the procurement and, and the scope and contracting process, which we'll be doing here in the, couple month, or in the coming months. Um, as part of this work, we will be setting up both an internal and an exter external stakeholder working group. Um, that internal will be focused on those that enforce, implement, build, plan uh, the facilities. Uh, the external one is going to be looking at how can we make an efficient, safe system uh, for users and also for non-users. Um, I, I would anticipate that during this process, we will be coming back to the Sustainability Commission, the Transportation Commission, as well as City Council to be able to provide updates as we move forward. Uh, but this would be a significant step in really uh, kind of increasing the effectiveness uh, of the bicycle transportation plan. So the city's pedestrian plan, um, the goal here was to really create uh, a, a safe environment for pedestrians. Um, and not just from the a perspective of physical safety, but also from an experiential quality. Uh, in order to encourage people to walk in the city, it also has to be enjoyable. It has to be a comfortable walk. Uh, so, so the city pedestrian, citywide pedestrian plan really focuses both on the safety aspect, but also the, the experiential quality. And the goal of that plan was to really provide measurable benchmarks in terms of how can we improve the pedestrian environment, um, how can we create a safer environment, more comfortable environment, but encourage people to use other modes of transportation? Um, this includes physical improvements. This includes education, um, Vision Zero, which I'll also mention here in a moment, which is which has become its its own kind of initiative, a, a compatible initiative to this and, and all other mobility transportation planning that we're doing in the city. Um, but something uh, that that will really help advance the goals of the pedestrian plan. Um, this chart, similar to the other, it is missing some information, as you can see, with the, the, the total number and the injuries and the fatalities, uh, but really focusing on kind of that red, that red bar, which shows the number of injuries uh, over the course of the years. And around 2015, we really saw a pretty significant spike in terms of, of incidents and injuries. Those numbers went down in 2016, 2017, and 2018, which was good. Um, that was that corresponds with the safety education campaign uh, that the city had engaged in, but we saw in 2019 a, a significant increase again. Um, and part of this this work uh, that we'll be doing with the bicycle transportation plan with Vision Zero, we'll be updating things like counts so that we can better understand why have these incidents gone up. Uh, we've looked at other data such as enforcement that has remained constant through this period of time. Um, we really want to try to understand why are we seeing this spike again. Um, in 2019 uh, and, and early indications from the 2020 data also show an increase as well. <clears throat> but the pedestrian plan in incorporates a lot of meaningful and impactful changes. Uh, things like turn pocket removals, 
um, really trying to reduce collisions between turning automobiles and pedestrians. Uh, in fact, the left turning uh, left turns uh, at intersections are the most frequent incidents of, of collisions between pedestrians and motorists. Um, uh, the diagram here on the left illustrating that. So where appropriate, removing things like left turn lane or left turn pockets. Um, opportunities for curb extensions, really trying to tighten that turning radii so the automobiles when making their turns, especially right hand turns, have to slow down much, much more than they do now. Um, right turn collisions were the second most frequent in the city. Um, so being able to do things like reducing speed, and that is one of the primary objectives of the pedestrian plan is reducing speeding behavior, um, is done through these kind of physical interventions, um, these kind of improvements such as turn, tighter turning radii. Uh, in some cases, we have lane reconfiguration proposals, um, pedestrian refuge areas, uh, things of that nature. But as mentioned, it's not just about the physical enhancements in terms of, of, of those kind of curb radii and, and lane reconfigurations. It's also about the comfort and the safety. So there are recommendations regarding enhanced lighting, uh, enhanced landscape buffers, improved wayfinding. Uh, signal timing is also uh, one of those considerations. That includes the, the push buttons or what we often uh, refer to as beg buttons, recalibrating that so that they are just in line with the traffic signals and that pedestrians um, are not required to push those buttons. Um, often what ha ends up happening is that encourages uh, crossing when there's not a, a signal for pedestrians uh, because they've missed that cycle. Um, and then as, as mentioned, lane reconfigurations. Um, some of these require the reconfiguration of the right of way um, that could change the number of lanes. It could change the width of lanes. Uh, again, trying to encourage slowing down for motorists um, but also creating a, a, a more comfortable environment uh, for pedestrians. This plan was recently adopted by city council, uh, a significant step for the city. Uh, we are in the process of looking at active transportation grants to help with some of the implementation. You can see the image on the right shows one of those pedestrian refuge areas. Um, these are common and kind of wider intersections, but where can we get opportunities for funding to, to start implementing some of these changes? Um, there are both long-term and short-term improvements that includes things like continuing uh, the safety education ca uh, campaign, uh, safe routes to school. But what we're looking to really do is try to identify consistent funding sources uh, to really start implementing the plan to make those physical changes that will, will hopefully change behavior and just create a safer environment in general. Um, may I ask a quick question before going any further? Do you have, have you mapped the sites where the accidents have taken place. I'm just wondering if there are, you know, highly dangerous intersections, you know, if accidents occur at the same, in multiple places, multiple times. We, we have, and, and I didn't include that in there for the, the sake of brevity, but uh, what we have found is that the high collision corridors are, are pri primarily located in South Glendale. Uh, around downtown, adjacent to downtown, uh, Glendale Avenue, uh, places like that. So what the plan does is it pr prioritizes where interventions should be made based on um, a, a formula, of, if you will, of uh, frequency of usage, frequency of incidents, but also equity. Uh, looking at where automobile ownership is lower, where dependency on multimodal options are more significant and prioritizing those locations. So as part of that plan and part of that implementation strategy, it does factor all of those things into it. Great, thank you. And as part of that work, Vision Zero uh, was a recommendation as, in, as part of the pedestrian plan. And really what this seeks to do is establish a time frame to eliminate fatal and serious collisions within the city. Um, this is looking even beyond just uh, uh, implementation and projects, physical changes. It includes planning and design. It includes the construction and, and, and implementation of changes, but also education and enforcement. Um, it's intended to be a holistic and comprehensive approach to uh, eliminate and, and uh, reduce collisions and fatal collisions. Um, it really focuses on things like safe street design and speed reduction, which is what our pedestrian plan does. Um, but also is supported by things like enforcement. Um, I had mentioned complete streets before. Again, the, the objective and the goal of creating streets that are usable by, by uh, uh, residents of all backgrounds, all ages, all demographics, um, and being able to meet the needs of all modes of transportation. Um, we are currently working with an internal working group as we start to establish a timeline and what the goals and objectives and what this plan will look like. Um, we are currently working towards assembling an external 
um, uh, essentially stakeholder working group that will help inform uh, and shape the Vision Zero policy. Um, much much like the or the uh, bicycle plan, you you will probably see this come before you again uh, in the coming months, as well as the transportation plan or parking commission and uh, city council. <clears throat> Another initiative that we're working towards is the downtown streetcar. Um, this is something that's been in the work for the past couple of years. Uh, what you're looking at here is a map of alternative two. There were two alternatives that were created. Um, I am showing this one because this is essentially the, the preferred alternative. Um, I, the, the real goal of the streetcar is to be able to connect downtown Glendale, our primary employment center, uh, a location with a high concentration of residents with our Larry Zarian Transportation Center and being able to connect people to Metrolink in a safe and efficient manner. Um, so what you're looking at here with the orange line uh, represents the route, which would uh, move up central, eventually crossing over. Um, we're still determining which street would be most feasible for this and then moving north and south along Brand Boulevard. There was another alternative that actually created a loop configuration where the uh, route would do what you see here, but in a one way manner, and then would turn back on central and go southbound. That is not really the preferred option because that's not a very user intuitive means of, of creating a streetcar. Um, it could lead to um, unnecessary length of travel time. Uh, it's not very intuitive for somebody who's not familiar with Glendale, who would not be familiar with the streetcar. Um, but this is a really good opportunity for us to really kind of bridge some of that first last mile connectivity, to be able to connect the, the primary employment center of the city to the transit center. Um, these are just some of the locations of, of, of some of the recommended stops. And this is some cross sections, uh, example of Brand Boulevard. Um, this would uh, run curbside, as you can see in the, in the graphic, there's the existing configuration and then the proposed. Um, it, would take, it wouldn't necessarily take out a lane of traffic. What it would do is it would share lanes of traffic um, on that far or on the bottom image on the far left side and then on, on, on the far right side. And then looking at Central Avenue, again, similar configuration. Um, we are planning to bring this back to city council in the coming months. Um, we are wrapping up the final report now, which will tell us things like anticipated ridership, cost, timeline, impacts to parking, impacts to land use, uh, things of that nature. Um, we were slated to bring that back to council. Um, I believe next month we've had to postpone that a bit, but we should be able to bring that back in the coming months. And shifting away from transportation, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of our long range planning efforts as it relates to land use uh, and development. Um, the downtown specific plan went through a, a pretty significant overhaul back in 2018, 2019. City council had asked staff to look at the downtown specific plan with really considerations aimed at improved design, uh, improved public realm, improved public open space, um, looking at things like what kind of mix of units are we getting? Are we creating uh, a residential environment that has a, a diverse range of housing typologies that is not just geared towards young professionals, but they could be multi-generational households as well. Um, there were significant changes that were made to this. Very clear and objective design standards were developed uh, in an effort to try to help applicants through the process with kind of clear direction, but also to prioritize what it is that council and the community wanted to see uh, from developments. Uh, and that was done through kind of an iterative process as we walk through walk through this with council and with um, uh, a stakeholder working group to identify how could we improve things like design, like the public realm. Again, the improvements to the public realm are important because uh, that's what's going to create that safe and comfortable walkable environment that will encourage people to use other modes of transportation other than driving. What we also created was a tiered community benefit system. This was kind of focused on, on really enhancing unit typologies, sustainability, uh, more open space within downtown. Um, these are some examples of some of the standards that were developed on the, on the left. What you're looking at is some street typologies that were created, really trying to widen the pedestrian realm, create a more comfortable pedestrian realm through vegetation and planting, but wider sidewalks in general, more active storefronts with usable space in front of the buildings, um, the image that you see in the top right shows the configuration and the allocation of public open space that is required. Um, what we were hearing from the community and the councils that the, the open space that was being created by many of the developments was not meaningful. Um, it was not something that was usable. It didn't incorporate elements like trees and vegetation, but it wasn't a place that felt like 
um, a respite from the urban environment that anyone could use. And then what you see in the bottom right are some, some of the de, uh, design and development standards to encourage uh, more aesthetically pleasing buildings to be developed. This chart represents what we call the tiered community benefit system. What we were trying to identify is what kind of improvements could the city receive from a community benefit perspective in exchange for the density that is allowed in some of these, uh, allowed in these sites. So what you see is kind of this, this three tiered approach that as you move up in terms of uh, overall density, overall scale and massing, there are more provisions that are required to the city. Um, this is actually uh, the, the table that highlights what those requirements are. Um, you can see as you move up the tier two and tier three, the requirements for public open space start to increase. Um, what we call the diversity and housing mix, where we were trying to encourage more two and three bedroom units in downtown, uh, really trying to focus on multi-generational households, um, being able to provide diverse housing options for, for our residents uh, was a priority identified by council. Um, you can also see some of the commercial requirements below. Um, there was a focus there for mobility improvements. There's opportunities to be able to provide um, either car sharing services or bike sharing services within a facility. Um, incorporation of public art on site uh, became a requirement. And then as you moved into tier three, sustainability, um, requiring lead platinum uh, for these developments. And we focused this on commercial developments because through the research that, that we had done, um, what we found is that lead platinum is much more common in commercial developments and through government and, and kind of civic structures, not as much through uh, multifamily housing necessarily. This was also intended to be a little bit of a placeholder um, as it gave uh, city staff more time to investigate what are more meaningful options that we can investigate uh, in terms of sustainability, which I'll touch on in a moment. Uh, I have a question on that slide. Yeah. Um, can you back up one, please? Yeah. So where it says 2% public art, is that by um, project budget, 2% of the budget, or by square footage, or? Construction cost. Construction cost, okay. All right, thank you. <clears throat> So these were, this is an example of some of the developments that, that uh, the city had received before. Um, nothing incredibly wrong with these developments, just lacking kind of aesthetic interest. Um, not a lot of meaningful open space. Uh, in this example here, that was uh, a point of discussion with the city council. The pedestrian, pedestrian realm was not wide enough, was not comfortable enough. And through those, those changes, we are seeing improvements in design. Um, this is an example of a project that's actually going through the entitlement process right now. Um, you can see much more, um, uh, I would say, permanent type of materials uh, using brick and masonry rather than EFIS. Um, the public open space is, is significantly larger. It's oriented to the pedestrian realm, encouraging buildings to open up and, and create a more meaningful interaction with the public realm. Um, this project actually received uh, very strong support from the city councils, one of the first, if not the first, uh, under the new DSP. Um, and, and we've received positive feedback in terms of the design approach um, and, and as well as the contributions to the public realm in improving kind of pedestrian comfort, pedestrian quality, and then open space as well. Are you also addressing permeable surfaces, trying to increase the amount of, increase that? We, we didn't in here, um, and actually in just a moment, I'm gonna talk about some more kind of sustainability elements that we're looking into uh, as part of this plan. Because what we didn't want to do when we, when we created this plan was, um, create something that was so cemented that we couldn't go back and make modifications. Uh, what we often see when we create plans is they're, they're set in stone and then 10, 15 years later, we start to go back and revisit and improve them. What we wanted to do is create something that could be responsive and nimble to changing circumstances. We might have learned that something didn't work as well as we hoped. There are going to be changes in technologies. There can be changes in best practices. And we wanted to be able to go back and update this plan to see that through. Um, so we went back to council about a year and a couple months after the, the adoption um, of the revised downtown specific plan. And we went with a, with a kind of menu of options that we wanted the council to give us feedback and input on uh, in terms of going back and revisiting um, or making changes to. Uh, one of those was the banning of new drive-through facilities in downtown. 
Um, that is something that we're working through now in terms of developing uh, changes to land use standards in downtown, recognizing both from a sustainability perspective of idling automobiles, uh, but also just the, the nature of conflicts that would occur with pedestrians, uh, multimodal transportation. We are looking does that apply at, just to, oh, I'm sorry, does that apply just to restaurants or also banks? No, it would be any drive through, uh, any new drive through. Would, okay. Under under this potential uh, ordinance would not allow for new drive throughs in downtown. <clears throat> we are also looking at a transfer of development pro rights program. Uh, the idea behind that is if someone owns one piece of land on one street, and another piece of land across the street, can they combine that development potential so that we can free up one of those parcels of land to create open space. Um, that was also something else that, that city council asked us to look into. And, and these are all things that we're in, in, in progress right now of, of, of developing alternatives and recommendations for that we hope to bring back to council in the coming months. Um, they also wanted us to look at multifamily unit sizes. Um, what should that minimum standard, uh, minimum size be calibrated at to encourage uh, the creation of affordable housing? And then sustainability was was a big topic that they wanted to return to. We had we had put the lead platinum requirement in for a tier three commercial development, um, but how do we look beyond that? So when we returned to council, we had put forth a couple of ideas. We could take the lead platinum idea and, and broaden that, um, or we could do something that's even more meaningful. Um, I think all of us are, are relatively aware of, you know, what are the, the top contributors to emissions? And it's not just the standalone building itself, but it's the context that it's in. Does it encourage people to choose an alternative mode of transportation? Will they walk, will they bicycle? Will they, will they choose something other than a single occupant vehicle? And what we found as part of that research is looking at things like lead neighborhood development or lead communities and eco districts um, as, as a potential alternative to create a more meaningful sustainability policy for downtown. Um, this is something that we are still in process of investigating um, again throughout the course of this year. And next year, we, we hope to bring back alternatives for city council, which ones are more viable. But what happens with the lead neighborhood development eco district is you have certain prerequisites that are already in place. It's not about the building itself being a, a, a discrete, singular, sustainable object, if you will, uh, but it's about the surrounding environment as well. Um, in the case of lead neighborhood development, it also requires buildings to achieve a certain level of lead certification, but it ensures that the building in the location that it's being put in um, also encourages sustainable behavior. Um, and it avoids things like what we would call um, uh, essentially in the building industry greenwashing, where um, if you're familiar with some lead buildings, um, there are uh, very suburban remote buildings that encourage a lot of automobile traffic that were able to achieve a lead gold standard because they put in low flow toilets and automatic shut off lights. But at the end of the day, it encourages uh, behavior that is still not sustainable. So that's part of what we're trying to investigate. What can we, what policy can we put in place and recommend uh, that will achieve a more meaningful sustainability strategy for downtown and potentially broader than downtown? That's also part of that consideration. <clears throat> We are also in the process of updating some of our general plan elements. Um, if, you've, if you've paid attention to council recently, they uh, adopted our, our housing element, which has been submitted to HCD uh, for the review. Um, this is currently in review by state, but meeting our obligations, our arena numbers to, to uh, provide enough affordable housing in the city of Glendale. As part of that, we're also looking at land use and circulation elements. Um, these are both in progress and both of them are relatively outdated. Um, what we're trying to do here is ensure that there's compatibility between the transportation improvements that are being proposed or have been made in the city and compatible with the land uses. Um, uh, particularly in, in encouraging people to use other modes of transportation, it's not just about having transportation alternatives, but it's about making sure that the land use alternatives, the land use options um, are befitting of those transportation um, alternatives that are being, uh, being implemented and being proposed. Uh, what the circulation element update will do will also complete the phase out of a level of service measurement and transition to vehicle miles traveled. Um, this was something that was required by the state. Essentially, it's a more meaningful way of measuring how we uh, uh, conduct our trips. 
Um, level of service really kind of focuses on the performance of a street, performance of an intersection. VMT looks at what's the proximity of other uses? What's the likelihood of how far you'll have to drive to go to work, to go to commercial services, to shop, to dine, things of that nature. And it's, it's, it's more relevant to how we actually travel. Um, <clears throat> because we Question are- Question on updated, that if I could. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, okay. I remember Laura Friedman saying a couple of years ago that she was looking at zoning because she wanted to allow things like bodegas scattered throughout the neighborhood. So you don't get in your car and drive to the large regional supermarket. You might be able to walk to the local bodega for, you know, if you just need a few items. Just wonder if you're incorporating considerations like that for zoning. And, and that's part of the update to the land use element is looking at the compatibility of uses uh, the location of uses, the relationship to transportation and to circulation. Um, it's not going to, you know, we can't zone specifically for a bodega, but it's about allowing potential commercial uses uh, in, in certain locations or the proximity of commercial uses to lower those VMTs, to lower the likelihood of you getting in your car and having to drive to go pick up a gallon of milk, for example. Um, those will all be looked at as part of uh, the land use and circulation element updates. Well, personally, I was sorry to see the level of service um, metric go away. So what what the main indicator of that is um, wait times. So it was uh, A through F, F being a, a failed intersection and uh, and D being like nearly failed. And, and there are lots of those in the city because we've overbuilt so much in South Glendale. So now that they have this sort of nebulous vehicle miles travel, you don't really know how how many miles someone's traveling when they go to an intersection. It's just not measurable. So I was sorry to see that, that change, but oh well. And what the VMT transition will allow for as well is that um, it's, it's, it's well known and widely documented that widening roads and adding lanes is not going to solve uh, our, our transportation woes or congestion. And that the best way to do that is to create alternative options for people to be able to, to walk, to cycle, to take transit. And what a lot of the VMT mitigation measures ensure is that it's gonna focus on creating uh, a safer walking environment, more cyclist facilities, uh, better connections to transit, uh, really trying to create those, those uh, the access to alternative options. Because we are updating um, several general plan elements, this will also include, uh, per the state requirement, environmental justice as well. Um, and, and we'll be looking at also systematically updating. We are working on, um, we'll be working on a safety element update. Uh, we will likely have to look at our parks and recreation and open space um, elements as well. Um, so these are all things that are, that are gonna be going on for the next couple of years. Um, much like some of the other uh, projects that I mentioned before, these will come back before the Sustainability Commission, Transportation, uh, Planning and City Council. And then lastly, what I'd like to touch on is the Verdugo Wash. Um, as part of the 2012 Bicycle Transportation Plan, it was identified that the wash could be a spine uh, for uh, multimodal transportation, open space, sustainability. Um, as part of the prior year budget, City Council allocated funding for us to investigate what are the options that are available, uh, what could we do with the wash, uh, what we're calling the Vertigo Wash Visioning Project. Uh, we say visioning because really right now what it's intending to do is, is identify what are options and alternatives uh, for the wash. What could we do with the wash um, to still uh, maintain its role as a flood control channel, but also how can we meet other objectives in the city? Um, more cycling, more walking, more open space, more green space, habitat restoration, water recharging, things of that nature. Those are all part of the conversation, the scope and the goal, um, the goal of the work for the Verdugo Wash. <clears throat> and I use this image as an example. This is the, uh, the old Fourth Ward Park in, in Atlanta, Georgia, which has kind of become um, a reference point for us. It's part of a larger project called the Atlanta Beltline. Uh, it's a rail, an interurban rail line that, that encompasses the city that's being transitioned into a, a pedestrian and cyclist pathway. But what they've also done is they've identified opportunities to restore habitat. Uh, what you're looking at here is a former parking lot for a Sears Warehouse Distribution Center. Um, the city of Atlanta had about a $48 million uh, stormwater issue uh, in terms of trying to pipe stormwater out. Um, and what they came up with is a $19 million park that does a better job than that. Um, it incorporates elements of, of habitat restoration, vegetation, stormwater retention. 
um, but it's still something that's also useful and meaningful for <clears throat> for the surrounding neighborhoods. Open space, green space. Um, this is actually designed to flood. In fact, if you look at the wall, <clears throat> excuse me, off to the right side, you can see two lines on the wall. Those are intended to mark out the 100 and 500 year flood events that can occur. Um, and this has really kind of served as um, a reference point for us and what we'd like to be able to achieve uh, with the Vertigo wash visioning. Something that can bring back uh, vegetation, something that can bring back habitat, but also creates meaningful space, open space, um, can be a, a spine for pedestrians and cyclists as well. So a number of, of other initiatives we looked at, we uh, West Sacramento and their, their barn project. Are there opportunities, particularly in the southern portion near downtown, to create more open space, social spaces, gathering spaces? Um, and then also improving that multimodal transportation. So this is the, the 606 in Chicago. Um, this is a former rail line that was converted into a cyclist and pedestrian path, all kind of serving as reference points and, 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 and inspiration for what we would like to be able to try to achieve with a vision for the Verdugo Wash. Um, this is the existing condition, um, a, a sample condition. It changes widths, it changes heights and depths, um, but this is kind of a sample condition from the southern and western portions of the wash. Um, and what's being considered is, is a concept of a raised platform with kind of deep planting wells that would allow the reincorporation of vegetation. Um, there's not a lot of opportunity to create a soft river bottom here. I think that was something that we all were kind of hoping for in the beginning of this process, but uh, trying to maintain the, um, uh, the objective of the wash as a flood control channel, if we were to soften that bottom, it slows down the flow, therefore um, increases the amount of water that is, that is stored and moving through this space and just isn't quite feasible. But there's an opportunity for us to create still meaningful vegetation. Um, there's still opportunities to be able to soften the bottom of portions of the Verdugo wash um, and being able to create these, these, these discrete and separate paths for pedestrians and cyclists, but also opportunities for open space. Um, these are some examples of some of the renderings, uh, some of the early concepts. There's still much work to be done in this, but these were kind of the first pass of what's possible with this idea of this raised kind of platform. Um, deep planting beds that would allow for vegetation and trees to be reincorporated. Um, you can see here a path for a cyclist and then path for pedestrians, but also opportunities for kind of moments of respite um, where it's not quite as concrete, not quite as harsh. Um, another example looking kind of on the far kind of south and western portions where we would be able to incorporate social spaces, gathering spaces, plazas, playgrounds, parks, things of that nature. Um, and then starting to look at some of the adjacencies to the wash as well. There are um, uh, larger areas, uh, the, the basin, the debris basin just north of Oakmont Country Club is a perfect example where we can look at something like the old Fourth Ward Park in Atlanta and see how we can bring back more habitat into this area, um, but also be able to create a meaningful open space uh, for, the, uh, for the general public. Again, kind of early initial passes, uh, but you can see kind of a boardwalk system, opportunities for plaza and access points. Um, and there's a number of different moments where there are city-owned parcels adjacent to uh, uh, the wash where we'd be able to look at doing some of these kind of initiatives, uh, really focused again on water recharging, um, water reclamation, um, and kind of habitat restoration. And then lastly, the mobility component of this. So this, this three, uh, these three images that you see, um, the color uh, kind of heat maps that you see represent how far someone could get using existing facilities on the far left image um, using a, a, a bicycle and how far they can get in a range between five and 30 minutes. And they're relatively, um, in terms of that kind of five to 15 minute range, really focused in downtown and going up the Glen Oaks corridor. The, uh, the center graphic represents if we were to use the existing access points along the wash, how far someone could get um, uh, through the city within that kind of same time frame. And you can start to see that those oranges and, or those, those purples and, and reds start to go a little further out. And then if we were to add additional access points on the far right image, how far someone could get in that five to 30 minute range on a bicycle. And this is important to note because if this is to be a, a sort of spine, uh, it starts to increase access opportunities for those that are not necessarily just right on the wash, but also uh, um, further south in Glendale. Being able to hop on that wash and maybe access an employment uh, center a little bit easier, an education resource, or even some of the parks that are along the wash or could be created along the wash. 
So this idea of having this protected separated facility could really help increase the range of residents across the city and access to resources. And that concludes my presentation. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bradley, for the presentation. That was very thorough. We appreciate it. Um, do we have any questions from commissioners? It's not a question, just a comment, uh, Chair. Uh, Brad, uh, one um, example that you might want to look at, and I think, I think it's fairly successful, is um, in downtown LA, the State Historic Park uh, that's adjacent to the Gold Line. Uh, they've done a good job of, uh, uh, you know, building uh, storm capture uh, and walkable uh, and bikeable uh, park. Um, so that's a one, you know, good example that I would recommend. And it's fairly uh, easy to get to from Glendale to go look at it. Great, thank you. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Bradley. Um, I, I'm a little bit um, disappointed that there isn't more need for the uh, mixed use and um, high rise residential. The lead BD plus C does cover those categories. And so um, it seems like they could have tried a little harder on that. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm a lead green associate, but I just feel like the city has has let developers off the hook for decades now. Um, Lee's been around for over 20 years, and and there's like zero requirements that anything be be built to those standards or 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 a single incentive even. And so I'd like to see you know we offer incentive, incentives for everything else. Why not offer incentives for development? And for the uh, two percent art thing, I I just saw the public benefit is there versus the the um the improvements to circulation and so on but i was wondering if you could give some examples of some of the circulation improvements that a um, developer might be required or, or or what's been effective in the past or are they all just opting to pay the extra two percent uh for the art and then get out of having to do circulation improvements uh, we haven't seen any commercial developments who uh, who have fallen under that system yet, so we haven't seen uh, which one they're going to choose. Um, what I would say, going back to also as a lead professional, um, we're not finished with that. Uh, this was a first blush. We had a, a conversation with council about how do we create a more meaningful, sustainable system, uh, and that's something that we're continuing to investigate. Uh, the city has incentivized uh, sustainability before. There are several lead buildings around downtown that have taken advantage of that original system. Um, but we, what we found is that they were going for a pretty low tiered system that was not um, executing meaningful uh, sustainability initiatives. Therefore, we decided to take that opportunity to reinvestigate what could we do to actually make sure that the contributions are meaningful to uh, in, a, in a sustainability um, component from a lead component. Um, but just achieving a lead bronze level, um, that actually doesn't even meet most state building code requirements at this point. It's already required through many of the state building codes, which you'll um, hear about in uh, the next upcoming session. So that afforded us the opportunity to investigate what would be more meaningful to incorporate, which is something we'll bring back to council. And I also think, um, Commissioner Werner and commissioners, I also think there's the opportunity as we go forward with the climate action adaptation plan to begin to address these issues, building performance issues, um, eco district issues, and build that into the requirements and the expectations of the climate action adaptation plan. And as Bradley said, I think what has been presented is a really good starting point for us to go forward. So I think it's, it's, it's a great point, but. Um, I think we have the opportunities in front of us. I think this is why it's so critical that Bradley and his team have come in front of the commission today to, to give you that background. So as you begin to formulate your ideas and thoughts about what should be addressed in the climate action and adaptation plan, you can bring some of these those thoughts to bear in that process. It just seems like a lot of the future development in the city is going to be more housing oriented and not so much commercial because of, you know, fewer office buildings and things like that with, you know, post pandemic and so on. So it would be nice if the, if the um, 
the, the building types that we're anticipating. I mean, I do get all the city notices and it just seems like it's, you know, 80% at least um, residential projects that uh, that those are the types of projects that they're they're planning to make as green as possible. Uh, things like uh, it requiring um, bicycle parking, like you're mentioning the, the bicycle plan, are they looking at having building owners provide a minimum number of um, bicycle parking places or bicycle storage? Right now they can swap out for a certain percentage of bicycle parking, but um, I, I think the parking conversation is, is probably a larger one um, that is, uh, we're currently investigating and looking into uh, kind of parking utilization in downtown now to inform uh, kind of future policy and are there opportunities to be able to swap that out, require it, um, increase the requirement, and, and that's all kind of ongoing work right now. Right, you're familiar with Don Shoup, I assume, UCLA. Very much so. <laughs> yes, okay. I, I find his ideas very interesting, yeah. Uh, very, we very, are very good for carpool. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, any other comments from commissioners? Um, I'll go ahead. Um, thanks again, Bradley. Uh, I wanted to you know, ask some questions, I guess, like on a per plan basis as it was presented to us. Um, with respect to the the incoming bicycle plan, um, I know you mentioned we're looking at an 18 month process. Do you know about where we are currently and how far away we are from the outreach component of that starting? Um, trying to do a little math here, uh, just thinking about our procurement process, you know, government agencies. Um, I, I would say probably by midsummer, uh, we would be in a phase mid to late summer in a phase of, of full on public engagement. Um, prior to that, we'll be in, uh, assembling the internal working groups, the external working groups. Uh, so some of those things will already start, uh, but I would anticipate sometime in the summer when we start to see a, see a more full blown public engagement process. Okay, great. Uh, that's, that's great. Um, and then for the pet plan, um, do you recall, I was trying to figure out in my notes when it was adopted. I know that the, the plan itself was done some time ago, but it was adopted mm -hmm. recently. Um, do you know when that was? It was just last year. Uh, I, I believe it was in the fall or the summer. I'm, I'm trying to recall the exact date, but um, it was just last year. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I remember, so I was on the that advisory committee, and and for those who haven't seen the pet plan, I highly recommend that you read it at, in your leisure, um, because that is an example of a, a really well done plan. Um, Bradley was kind of alluding to how the the existing bike plan is kind of outdated, and um, I think in contrast, the pet plan was done very exhaustively and has really good. Uh, recommendations and things within that plan that um, the city can embrace to really advance active transportation in the city. Um, and I'm happy to hear that we're pursuing active transportation grants. Um, I'm curious, are, are we tapping into Measure M funding for the PED plan? You know, the, the PED plan has very specific recommendations on funding strategies and I think they even outline what projects within the plan to pursue first, that mm -hmm. short term, medium term. Are we are we following the plan prescriptively or are we kind of starting from scratch in terms of figuring figuring out what strategies to deploy? Um, I, I think it's kind of a combination of, of both, right? Whatever, wherever we can find opportunities and funding sources and how we can prioritize that. I think the plan is still the guiding force obviously. Um, but we, you know, we're right in the middle of a budget season for all kinds of things, including Measure M. So identifying those funding sources and being able to move forward are uh, uh, definitely a priority. Uh, we, we've heard, especially from the community and council, how much of a priority is to see this implementation um, uh, go forward. So, Okay. Um, and then uh, uh, just as you mentioned with the bike plan, what's the, where are we at with the Vision Zero plan? And, um, 
we don't have a consultant on board yet. So when do you anticipate that happening and, and how long do you think that process would be? Um, I would say that's probably going to run pretty parallel to the bicycle transportation plan. Um, we, we just started kicking off internal meetings right after the turn of the year or just at the beginning or at the end of last year, excuse me, sorry. Um, and, and trying to put together that work plan and then ultimately putting together those, um, uh, external facing, uh, stakeholder working groups. So I would imagine that it's probably going to run relatively parallel to the bicycle transportation plan. It's also a good opportunity to be able to do outreach on both of those and, and understand the relationships between the PED cyclist plan and, and all modes of mo mobility. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just something to think about. I, I'm, I'm wondering out loud if those advisory committees can be joint because it, it seems there's quite a bit of parallel when it comes to, you know, the safety advocates and people who are uh, in tune with urban planning and want to pursue these kind of initiatives within the city that there is a lot of overlap and perhaps maybe easier for staff to kind of navigate those meetings and advisory committees. I think there will definitely be some joint meetings that, that occur in there. Yeah, great. Um, and then uh, with respect to the streetcar, uh, I didn't know it was still being pursued. Uh, I, I remember submitting a survey on the alignment options maybe two years ago at this point, but as a, uh, as a constituent, I haven't heard any updates since that time. I, I assume I'm on some mailing list. Um, I, I was not aware of the shared lane uh, pursuit. Uh, you know, usually with these kind of heavy investments in infrastructure, you know, part of the benefit of doing this is that it is separated from car traffic. Uh, otherwise, it, it may as well be a bus that is sitting in traffic with other cars and is a fraction of the cost. So what, what is the city thinking when, when we're looking at this kind of heavy investment that is just sitting in traffic like everybody else? Well, I, I think when, if we were to move on to a next phase of work, um, it does not preclude uh, its own separated travel lane, if you will. It doesn't mean that that's completely out of consideration. It would just need a lot more analysis to understand what those impacts to, to traffic would be overall. Um, but it's fairly common for a streetcar uh, to share lanes. Uh, but as you noted, it, it's also fairly common for it to get stuck in traffic like everyone else. Um, so I, I think being able to advance into a next phase of, of study uh, will be important to understand what are those implications in both directions. Is it still a meaningful and useful and efficient system? Um, and is it having um, such negative impacts to, to traffic that it, it's not feasible to, to share? So what is, what is the next uh, uh, decision point with that project? Is, it, is there some study or analysis ongoing currently? And is council going to provide feedback on the project at some point before additional funds are spent on it? Yeah, we, we're going to take the final report to council and, and give them an overview of, of expected ridership, um, uh, impacts to things like parking, land use, uh, uh, things of that nature, and then seek direction if there's um, a desire to pursue additional funding to go into the next phase of work for that. And, and we anticipate, um, I'd like to say sometime in April, uh, getting that to council, May at the latest. Okay, great. Um, okay, and then uh, as far as the downtown specific plan, um, I, I think you know this was coming as the this drive-through ban. Um, uh, I'd like to look into that further and, and explore that option as a citywide initiative. Um, I understand what the benefits are for the downtown area, but I, I think those benefits also extend to everybody uh, within the city, not just limited to the downtown area. Um, so I, I'd like to know if that is something that we should be looking at as it relates to the DSP or if this is a parallel conversation to have, but I, I'd like I'd like to not uh, uh, waste any time and want to want to pursue that as quickly as possible. And I know that David has some some initiatives that there will be some opportunities to consider that um, we have our land use element um, as well, where we consider that. I, I think for this starting point, uh, council wanted to look at downtown, and that's that's the one we're moving forward with uh, in in 
more near term, if you will, um, but is something that could be looked at uh, more broadly as well. And does that include, does the downtown specific plan uh, option include gas stations or that's excluded from what you would consider a drive through? If I am not mistaken, and if, if Eric's there, he might be able to help answer. I uh, I don't believe they're allowed in any of the downtown zones right now. So that wouldn't be uh, a concern. Um, this is really focused on uh, drive-through restaurants, bank facilities, things of that nature. Okay, and then the last thing on the DSP, um, is there some kind of, um, or could there be some kind of moratorium on uh, roadway widening. Um, and I, I asked that because I have seen some segments of our roadways widened as a result of development. Um, there's the, the Brio apartments on Colorado off of the freeway um, that required a, a roadway dedication. There's also the uh, uh, Camden on Los Feliz that also required a right turn pocket. Um, for developments downtown, I, I would like to think that along with pedestrian enhancements, we are not pursuing these kind of efforts that that trigger a roadway widening. Um, so is that part of the mix or could it be part of the mix? Uh, I don't believe there's anything in downtown that would be widened uh, based on any uh, potential future projects. Uh, looking more broadly citywide, uh, that's part of the circulation element update is to look back at that because there are some, um, I guess I would say antiquated uh, requirements for widening some streets that are not meaningful. Uh, it's not giving us a bicycle lane or a widened sidewalk or even parking. It's just something that was put into a document and and therefore is is being asked of. Um, part of updating that circulation element will will make sure that that's coordinated with things like our bike plan, our ped plan, um, so that widenings, if they are to occur, are really focused more on things like safety or alternative modes of transportation. Um, and that's something that will be going on over the course of the year. Okay, great. Um, and then I, I did want to piggyback off of, um, I believe it was Rondi's comments about just kind of procedurally how things move forward, because I know we're, we're going to be posing a lot of policy related questions to the planning department, I, I suppose at the next, the, at our next meeting when we, we want to dive in deeper with these policy initiatives. Um, and them eventually being a part of a climate action plan but the the previous comments got me thinking you know when we adopt this climate action plan that has a slew of uh, policy initiatives for the planning department i know that that doesn't trigger an immediate um, effect on say the circulation circulation element or the the uh, general plans like what are the 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 decision points where the things that we're looking at in the climate action plan actually get adopted into these other plans that are standalone policy documents. Um, th that's what I'm kind of curious how we're going to weave that um, and what that looks like in, in practice. Uh, Chairman um, Boutrous, if, um, that, that that's a great question. And as part of the work um, that we're going to ask consultants to do as we develop the current plan is to look at those specific issues. So actions, mitigation actions or um, carbon reduction actions that are within the climate action plan, how do we begin to make sure that those are incorporated into the decision making process of the city? So I don't think we have an answer for that just yet, but it is something that we know we need to do and we're aware of, and it is specific tasks we're going to ask the consultants to help us with as we develop the climate action plan just because of the importance of that issue yeah yeah that's that's great and, and i guess i'd like i would ask that that exercise happen internally as well with city staff because i want to make sure that we're not missing these opportunities like say for example this uh let's let's say let's say the sustainability commission wants to recommend that we not have uh, new drive-throughs in the city, citywide. That, I, I understand, has an effect on the general plan, which I know cannot be updated 
often. There's a there's a limit to when and how frequently they can be updated. So, you know, <clears throat> you can adopt a climate action plan in a year and a half, but and, and if, if within that plan we have these specific recommendations, when do they actually translate to the general plan, the land use plan, circulation element? I I, I want to make sure that we're not we're not skipping over years because there's only specific times that they can be updated. So I guess I don't expect an answer right now, but maybe at the next meeting, uh, planning can talk to us about what that looks like in terms of implementation. What I would say to that is uh, like the land use element, that's going to be the, the climate action plan is going to be an overarching guiding document. It doesn't mean that if there's something recommended in there and now we need to go and change the land use element, we can go and change the land use code. Um, so if things start to emerge in there, let's take your, your drive through uh, ban as an example, we would be able to go, we would go back and change the land use code provided that council approved that, that kind of change. Um, it, it wouldn't have to hold it up necessarily. You wouldn't have to wait several years to, to get to that point. Um, obviously there would be some time. It would take some time to be able to do that and, and go through the motions and the process. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have to systematically start going through every single planning document and making that change. It all depends on the nature of the policy. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess it'd be helpful. You know, we, we are not the experts and we don't know the timelines in which the city is updating various plans. Uh, we do to some extent after tonight's meeting, but you know, the housing element, for example, that that isn't touched for many years at a time. So um, I guess it'd be helpful for the commission to know what, what those dates are for the various plans. And uh, if our climate action plan can't put things into effect immediately, what what those are and, and, and when those things are coming up so that we can act or react accordingly. Mm -hmm. Just to echo what Alex just said, I think that would be something interesting to have on the city's website so anyone can access that information. I think um, sometimes okay. the city doesn't actually know because it takes a lot of resources to do these plans and they have to apply for grants and things like that. So it's very expensive to, to update these plans. I think that's why we have so many that are as old as they are, but just throwing that out there. Um, I did want to mention something that because the red car, you know, electric trolley thing isn't, doesn't look really that viable with all the infrastructure, you know, there's a lot of costs, very unsightly electric lines everywhere. Um, I, I just have never been a fan of that, but something that I always thought would be great in Glendale is to have one of those um, uh, trolley themed, um, well, the I guess they're called trolleys also, but they're not, um, dependent on the, you know, the electric uh, infrastructure, they're, you know, a little bit more like a bus. Um, Santa Barbara has one, and it's, um, it gives you that nostalgic look and everything that I think the city is looking for, even though, you know, every day there's fewer and fewer people around that mm. remember when Glendale had a, had a red car, but if anyone, but, but um, I just feel like, you know, the, but they're quaint, and so I think that's why it's, you know, caught caught on to some extent that there's an effort to bring that back or whatever but you know we're, things think well, a lot has changed since those red cars were enacted and just the impacts on traffic if they had a dedicated lane and everything would just make it pretty unworkable but i just wanted to encourage you if you haven't already to look into the the ones that i believe they're electric and and they're just kind of a little bus type thing but they're they're trolley looking <laughs> and so that might give you the best of both worlds no infrastructure costs but something that kind of fulfills that nostalgic need thank you um all right thank you everybody uh, i i will say um you know as, as far as the climate action plan goes i'm very much excited to kind of get into the meat and potatoes with the planning department on what we can do as a commission, uh, as an urban planner, I feel strongly that of all of the departments, at least in my opinion, the planning department has the most 
uh, influence over what we can do as a city to address climate change and, and address sustainability as a city. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to a meaty discussion uh, uh, when you come back so we can get into really the policy issues and, and also hear what you have to say about what you think uh, planning can do and what uh, how we can incorporate your efforts into the climate action plan. So I'm hoping for a, a thorough conversation and, and looking forward to uh, addressing those issues specifically with planning. So uh, thank you for tonight's presentation and, and looking forward to more. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. And uh, I guess let's move on to the next item. Uh, let's go to item number five, auction items. 5A, single use plastic prohibition expansion. 5A1, sustainability commission motion. Uh, sorry, Vlad, sorry. <laughs> um, in oral communications, do we have any phone calls or anything or any? Uh, we do not have callers at this time. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Vlad, I apologize. Uh, uh, 5A, auction item, single-use plastic prohibition expansion. 5A1, sustainability commission motion recommending the city council to direct staff to prepare an ordinance regulating the use of single-use plastics, food service wear, polystyrene, food service wear, polystyrene coolers, polystyrene food packaging trays, and on-premises uh, dining reusable food service wear. Thank you. Let me get my presentation up. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so thank you, and thank you, Commissioners. So I'm um, going to talk to you today and um, ask for recommendations regarding expanding um, the prohibition on single-use plastics um, within the city. So. Um, a little bit of, of why we're here. So um, sit, when we passed the um, first two single-use plastic ordinances in, in the city, City Council did ask us to come back to them at some point in the future and um, provide them with information and a report on expanding, um, say, the prohibition of single-use plastics citywide and what that would look like. Um, the aim of continuing to introduce plastic waste um, that is generated in the city and how we have to manage that plastic waste. Um, also to encourage our community to look at purchasing alternative materials to single-use plastics for their needs. Um, to help and assist out with Senate Bill 1383, the Organic Recycling Regulations, trying to remove single-use plastics from the waste stream, um, which is a contaminant, and then Assembly Bill um, 1276, um, which is a statewide single food waste accessories. So, um, so with this, before we started to um, put together a staff report and a plan, we actually did a, a survey um, to all our food service where, um, or food service establishments within the city to try and get um, try and understand what they were thinking uh, about this issue, what kind of practices they'd undertaken regarding um, eliminating and reducing single-use plastics um, within their operations. So we got some, some fairly interesting responses, which I'll just go over briefly. Um, so one of the first questions we asked them is to, you know, what type of reusable food service were um, they used at the establishment for on-premise dining? And... Um, we found that a majority of the establishments were likely to offer reusable food serviceware to dining customers. And there's a reason why we asked that question, um, which I'll talk about a little bit further on. And regarding not only them offering um, reusable food serviceware to their customers, but how do they manage that? So do they have like dishwashing facilities? 
I'm obviously a dishwashing facility, but I do have dishwashers and everything on, on to help them with that. Um, only 70% of establishments actually had dishwasher appliances. The rest would be like hand washing, I assume, or, or, or maybe not. So that was an interesting um, fact that came out of that. Um, so we also wanted to find out um, what type of single food were food service were the establishment for um, single use plastics were given out for on premise dining. And you can see the big thing here is people still continue to give straws um, and portion cups. So those are some of like, so we know that those are that's an issue that we need to address to try and eliminate um, that waste stream or that material um, from a waste stream as much as possible. Um, again, we asked them how likely they were to offer reusable food service where options to dining, dining customers. 50% um, said they would, and then another 50% said they were not inclined to or just would offer a few um, options to their dining customers. And again, um, we asked the question, what disposable food where items do you provide your customers? As uh, so the big one for us was the um, to-go containers. Um, so that is when they're leaving the restaurant, obviously people ask for doggy bags, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where that comes from. And then along with that, they often provide utensils and stirrers and other items. Um, and then we asked specifically regarding to go orders. And again, the big thing that was provided was straws, utensils, and condiment packages, and then a minimum amount of um, additional plates and bowls. So just to recap, we have done phase one and phase two focused on reducing single use plastics. Phase one, as you know, was focused primarily on city facilities. So city events, city manager events, city sponsored events. And city council wanted us to focus on city facilities first so we could learn um, what it was like to put an ordinance like, such like this in place and then follow through with that ordinance. Um, and then phase two was skip the stuff provisions, um, expanding that citywide. So that is when you go and order takeout or delivery, um, you have to ask for um, utensils, condiment packages, and other items like that. They're not automatically provided to you. So this next stage would be the third phase um, in this whole area um, of trying to expand, expand the um, prohibition of single use plastics. Um, and then through um, what we've learned and um, speaking to people, um, what we're kind of focused on in this area is we need to be focused on specific requirements for prohibiting the use of certain polystyrene items as well as single use plastics. And then the city council wanted us to include um, requirements for on-premise dining. So based on what we learned, based on the, the requirements of city council, and based on what other jurisdictions have been done, we're beginning to formulate this, this phase three um, kind of policy. Um, so what we, what we propose is that um, Certain items be no longer used, sold, or distributed within the city. So that would be plastic serres, um, plastic straws, and, and plastic utensils. So they would be prohibited um, from, from selling or distributing those items um, within the city. The next area of concern is polystyrene food trays and egg cartons and packaging peanuts. Um, so with this, we want no, regula no regulated entity would be allowed to sell, offer for sale or distribute within the city any meat, poultry tray, produce tray or egg tray made in whole or apart from polystyrene. And then regulated entities shall not use, sell or distribute polystyrene packaging materials, including but not limited foam peanuts, packing peanuts, foam popcorn, etc, etc. Um, regarding the packaging items, if there are items that would be acceptable in the city's recycling and composting program, those would be allowed. Um, so again, it's to try and eliminate um, these polystyrene items from a waste stream. David, quick question, yeah. if I may. Yes, sir. Um, 
you uh, said uh, the regulated entities. Can you give us an example of a regulated versus unregulated entity? So what I mean by regulated entities would be restaurants, um, bars, um, food trucks, food preparers, but it would also include um, supermarkets, um, okay. small stores, anybody who sells or distributes those type of items. And what would be an unregulated entity in Glendale? Um, there wouldn't, so somebody that is not a food service provider, if that makes sense. Okay. I, I think you're following what LA did. So we, our regulations pertaining to foodware, foodware accessories apply to all food and beverage mm -hmm. providers. We use the state definition, and the only exceptions are licensed healthcare facilities. So I, th I think that's, I, I believe that's what the scope David is talking about here. But was yeah exactly. So would a hospital cafeteria, for example, be able to use uh, the food containers? So that's very good. So the cafeteria where the public would come in and go to while they're waiting to they would be subject to the requirements, but not the serving of patients in hospital beds. The, okay. the, those would not be subject to these requirements. Okay, thanks. And, and just to piggyback off of that line of questioning, would the schools be subject to this regulation or do they follow state requirements? That's a very good question. Um, if there's a citywide ordinance that we develop and we'd have to look to see if the schools would be had come under that ordinance okay um essentially a, a, a regulated entity you know in this case essentially what that means is anybody selling a carton of eggs would essentially fall under this ordinance is, is what i'm understanding uh just to make it clear to the public. <laughs> um, so the, the regulated entities, um, the proposed expanded single-use plastic prohibition would impact defined regulated entities, which are any public or private entity or business, regardless of whether it consists of a sole proprietor, corporation, partnership, or any other manner of organization associated a group that is a food or beverage provider. Let me toss in something that might help clarify. San Francisco has a very expansive mm -hmm. EPS ordinance, one of the most expansive in the state, and they regulate these same items. And this has withstood challenge, legal challenges. Um, David, if I make one comment on this slide we're looking at, mm -hmm. you might want to say foodware as opposed to food trays, because trays to me implies one specific item where foodware if that's your intent, is a broader term that encompasses cups, bowls, plates, et cetera, if that is the scope that you're aiming for here. That is, and that's, I think, going to be the, the next slide, which would, okay. uh, so, well, on-premise dining, um, we would ask or probe it, the single-use plastic for on-premise dining, reusable items would have to be used for all on-premise dining. Uh, David, one other comment. It shouldn't just, should it just be plastic, single use plastic, or why not all single, why not ban all single use, including fiber based? Yes. I, I would not call out just plastics. Okay. Yep, no, good point. And then any takeout, delivery, disposal, food service, where would have to be acceptable to the city's organics recycling program? So I think that answers your question, Jennifer. That um, yes. We would want to expand the scope a little bit um, to these right. items. So, yes, thank you. My pleasure. I, I um, just know we've had issues about definitions and right. <laughs> yes. come back to bite you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> then looking to 2023 and beyond as we begin to phase this in, um, so no entity should sell any polystyrene food service where, so for example, that's a solo cups that you may get in supermarkets. We want to try and um, prohibit the sale of those type of items, um, polystyrene coolers, and then 
bottled water ban for city events and contractors. And this is specific to bottled water, not, for example, to a bottle of Gatorade, um, just because for bottled water, there's so many alternatives that are out there. Um, we can easily um, eliminate the use of bottled water and people can have, let's say, can have use alternatives um, to quench their thirst. Um, so based, next steps is based on recommendations from this commission. Um, we'll prepare a report for City Council. Um, ask the City Council to provide direction to staff to prepare an ordinance. Um, we hope to go to, we're scheduled to go to City Council on March 22nd with that. So um, all your comments tonight will be incorporated in that further report. And then there is some alternatives that this um, Sustainability Commission may wish to consider as they're providing their recommendations on how we intend to go forward um, regarding this um, regulation to, again, eliminate as much as possible single-use plastics, polystyrene, polystyrene coolers um, within our city and try and eliminate or reduce as much as possible those items in our waste stream. Um, so just that. one other quick comment. I'm sorry, David. Yeah, okay. uh, in, in LA, we phase these ordinances in. So first they apply to large businesses, which we define as having 26 or more employees on a national basis. And then we gave smaller entities. Um, they had to comply six months later. Um, what else? Oh, and just also, there are some case studies out from an organization called Rethink Disposables that was operating primarily in the Bay Area, but they've started working in LA and they conducted multiple case studies with food and beverage facilities, vendors of all sizes. When you switch to reusables, they have all realized a profit, usually within a very short period of time, three to six months. Hmm. You know, disposables may seem cheap because right. you buy them in probably smaller quantities, but um, that group, LA is now working with them to do some case studies and do some pilot projects. And they work to find grant funds to assist with the upfront purchase costs of reusable foodware. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to throw that out because I know the economic argument is one we hear most often that restaurants can't afford this, but reusables are cheaper. And actually the fact that 70% of the restaurants have dishwashers is astounding to me. I don't think it's anywhere near that high in LA. Okay. Um, and one thing I'm recommending is that we look at building codes to mandate commercial dishwashers in uh, rooms, for example, in food courts in malls or um, other developments um, and space for dishwashers to facilitate the use of reusable foodware. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with everything Jennifer, um, Commissioner Pinkerton just said, um, uh, plus with the oh, Jennifer, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and with the indoor dining, uh, to me, I, I've been, I think the pandemic has a little bit to do with it. They just kind of got in the habit of putting some of these side dish things like your your um, dips and things at a, a table service restaurant, you know, in these disposable um, containers. And it just, for me, it just ruins the dining experience. I mean, I'm, you know, there's all this nice china, you know, nice wine glass, all this kind of thing. And then out comes this you know, these little plastic cups, you know, on your plate. And, and I just, it just seems like laziness and, and uh, like a fast food experience at um, table service prices. So anyway, um, I, I'm glad that that made it onto the, the um, recommendation too, because um, I think that that's so unnecessary. And, and I, I've been seeing it at places that I, I know for sure have dish, dishwashers and they're still using disposables. Yeah, I think there's going to be um, a lot of education that's going to have to go along with this as to Commissioner Pinkerton point, um, you know, using reusable items can in fact be a cost saving. So we're going to have to get that evidence and get that in front of the food service providers um, to make sure they understand that. And um, one of the recommendations is to do um, a much more, ex one of the lessons learned from introducing the skip the stuff provision is that we need to do a more comprehensive education program that's definitely the feedback we got 
Um, so that will be part of any program going forward to make sure that we do. Have we developed a flyer for that yet? Have we have. That's gone out. It's gone out to all the all the um, all the establishments in Glendale. Should have that flyer by now. Could and you send it to us so we can help socialize it? Because there are places I I frequent that uh, still haven't uh, gotten the memo on that. Sure, we we can be happy to do that. And then you know, and then there's there's also you know what commission and city council needs to be aware of too is um, if we do get direction to develop such an ordinance um, the code enforcement side of it is an issue you know and so it's we do not currently have the staff um, to go out there and, and do serious enforcement so it's uh, either people reporting to us um, the, the food where the, the food and beverage establishments are, are not complying, for example, with this get the stop provision. Um, we are also trying to develop relationships with uh, Los Angeles County Department of Health because they're the main inspectors for the food and beverage establishments and asking them as part of their inspection process whether they can help educate um, there's establishments about skip the stuff provision and we'll do this ordinance too and then let us know if they see a restaurant um, not being in compliance so th th that has to be th that has to be discussed yeah, that whole enforcement issue David the question uh, do the normal suppliers that these restaurants uh, get their supplies from whether it's restaurant depot or other suppliers did they have uh, alternatives that they can easily order or should we provide them maybe with a list of national suppliers that, you know, say if, if the excuse is my normal supplier doesn't carry, um, you know, sustainable products mm -hmm. um, and that's the person that I have an account with, um, would it be easier for an analyst to put together a list of national suppliers and say, if that's your excuse, uh, you know, here are some alternatives that you should, uh, you know, look at. Uh, Commissioner Cartunian, that, that, that's a that's a great question. And where we have seen cities implement such ordinances, they do provide like an FAQ, frequently asked questions, and then a list of websites, restaurants, retailers that can provide those items that okay. help the foodware establishment meet um, the requirements of the ordinance. And that also, I think, feeds back into um, Commissioner Pinkerton's comment as you know, rolling this out to the larger people first and then to the smaller people so, so we can we can have them educate them and help them acclimatize to the ordinance and hold their hand because you know, at the end of the day, we want them to be able to do this. We want to encourage them to do it and make it easy for them as possible for them to comply with the ordinance. That's I think that's that's our, our thought process as opposed to like punishing is like how how can we make sure that you comply with this in the best way possible? Because it's a whole lot easier for the national chains right. to comply. They have right. folks that you know go out there to go to the conferences and the the fairs and and you know compare the items and, mm -hmm. and buy in bulk. The mom and pop stores, uh, you know, they usually run to Smart and Final or Costco or, uh, you know, Restaurant Depot and buy their supplies. Um, mm -hmm. So I think for the mom and pop stores, it would be easier if the city can say, look, you know, th this is the code now and here are some suppliers you can look at and let them choose. We're not favoring one or the other. Uh, I'm sure somebody has a list out there. Yep, absolutely. That's a great suggestion. We'll do that. Thank you. Just a couple comments along that line, just to what we're doing in LA. We are hoping to meet with LA County Health very quickly because we found out a lot of restaurants, I've gone in places where they're saying, oh, we can't give you reusables because of COVID, which is not true, but that is a very common misperception. So we're hoping to send out a joint city county letter to all the restaurants in LA saying that's not true. And also that was it AB or 6B, SB 619 from Judy Chu, 
restaurants can decide if they want to let customers bring in their own reusable food and beverage mm. containers because that will also save them money. Um, mm. So we want to get out a letter about that. The second thing is um, City of LA, we're going to work on having um, our commercial composters certify products as far as their compostability. Mm. And once that process is done, I imagine that'll be ongoing as new products come out, but right. we're glad to share that list of what's been determined compostable. And then the last thing is I got permission from an LA city attorney to help assist with cooperative purchasing to the commissioner's comments, because the mom and pops, like you said, probably go to, you know, the closest store where they can buy these things. We, we can't set up the cooperative purchasing, but we can try to bring all the stakeholders together mm -hmm. um, to set up an informal cooperative purchasing where mm -hmm. small restaurants can sign up and take advantage of the better pricing the larger entities get. Mm -hmm. So we hope that will facilitate the transition. Thanks. I think that composting, the commission thing to know what items are compostable. I think providing that information to the food and beverage providers is going to be absolutely critical. In the in the success of, of them yeah because i really them. right we and we do want my preference would be um you know fiber-based containers that have no pfas in right. them or no other coatings although i understand that kind of conflicts because when you have hot or leaky items unfortunately foam is the best container for those typically it doesn't leak it retains heat so i know there's going to be some resistance but um we've got to look at our requirements under you know, the organics diversion requirements too. Uh, just uh, along, the, along that line, Commissioner Pinkerton, I was um, reading an article from Manchester City Football Club in the UK. And when they hand out hot beverages now, you know, apart from beers, when they hand out the hot beverages, they actually hand it out in an edible cup. So you can drink your hot chocolate and then eat the cup and you, you're good to go. <laughs> so we're getting there. That's great. <laughs> Um, I had some comments um, working backwards. Uh, there was a, a mention about water bottles at city events. Um, I don't think that applies to private events that are happening uh, in like on city property. Was that covered by the, the this phase two, like what we did with farmers markets, or is that a section that's just not covered as part of this ordinance? We would have to look at the language going forward to see how we would cover that. Um, so right now in the phase one, we, we don't address bottles specifically, but the language there of defining what is a city event, what is a city sponsored event, what a city property and, and where the ordinance would apply, it took us a, a decent amount of time to pin that language down. So we'd have to go through that same process again regarding how the specific bottled water, who would it apply to? Um, I think initially it'd just be for city, you know, as opposed to the general public. But we we will we'll look at that language. Yeah, I guess I'd like to I'd like to suggest that part of our recommendation be that council ensure that this this next phase include all events within the city um because i'm i'm thinking of these larger scale events like cruise night for example mm -hmm. you know that's that's not a city of glendale event they have their own special permit uh to do their events and they could be handing out thousands of water bottles in theory um but then you have events like, you know, Cicla Via that draw a, a, a similar crowd, if not larger. And I know they have a process where they tap into fire hydrants and they have filtration systems that mm -hmm. actually turn a fire hydrant into a water fountain. So I'm curious about council looking into that because, um, you know, in, in the scale of things, city events you know, I hate to say it, are not the things that draw the huge crowds that private events may be drawing. So I, I just want to make sure we're not missing as we're pursuing this ordinance. Um, you know, if we're if we're going to do it, let's let's include it and um, make sure all events are covered. So that that would be, I guess, an official addition to the recommendation. Um, and then. Uh, I noticed the thing about egg cartons. 
<clears throat> egg cartons are interesting because I noticed in the language it mentions polystyrene would be banned, but not plastic. So I, I have seen in the grocery stores that there are, there are egg cartons right. made of plastic. And we, we all know the common egg carton is not made with plastic. It's cardboard material. And so I wonder, can this ordinance just cover all plastics for egg cartons and just have it be paper only? Yeah, I mean, I don't see that being an issue. Okay, good. So currently, I think we'd have to, yeah, we'd like polystyrene. What number is that on the um, on the recycling codes? Is it a seven, which I think those plastic egg cartons are. So yeah, we could specify the language to make sure that there's clear plastic, I think, ones that you're talking about included yeah yeah so just no plastic egg cartons essentially um why limited to the polystyrene uh so that that would be another item that i'd like to have included and then um i did have a question about enforcement so in the staff report and and your previous comments you mentioned enforcement being an issue i'm i'm a little confused by that i know there are times when the city would have a, a, a person doing enforcement for a specific thing, like, for example, like the smoking ordinance in Glendale. We had, I don't know if we still have that person, but we had a, a position specifically addressing uh, comments that would come in about the smoking ordinance. I don't envision a need for that for something like this. Rather, I would imagine that this would be embedded into other enforcement mechanisms um, that don't require additional staff, uh, but could require some staff time. So, you know, My Glendale, the My Glendale app is a go-to for all, all things. Um, why not this be part of that? And there, there are code enforcers, there are people in building and safety that go out to businesses, presumably to do code compliance. Why not this be part of their portfolio to uh, also enforce this ordinance? So, you know, I can call the city tomorrow and say, hey, look, this business is whatever. They have, they have seating outside when they're not permitted. Mm -hmm. In theory, I assume a staff person will go out, will do a site visit, will talk to the business and say, look, this isn't allowed. Mm. I imagine this could just be folded into that uh, workflow. Um, and, and if it's not prioritized, that's fine. I know there's a lot of competing interests and there's a lot of things. Going on. Um, but it doesn't mean that it, it couldn't be included. Uh, you know, if that person, if those enforcers are busy that day and can't get to something as minuscule as this, you know, then so be it. But to say outright that we just don't have enforcement capacity, I don't accept. Um, and I say that because there are businesses in the city of Glendale, I can think of one specifically, but I won't mention their name, that uses polystyrene, whether you're dining in or dining out. You know, it, they're spitting it out. It's thousands of customers a day. It's a very popular place. And I, I can see that if there's no stick uh, or reason for them to switch other than the city of Glendale kindly asking them to, that there's there's no there's no scenario in which we imagine that they'll comply. Um, so i I want to make sure that as part of this ordinance, we make we are, we are factoring in that enforcement piece. Otherwise, you know, we're not we're not going to see a, a, a demonstrated difference um, in compliance. No, no maybe. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, when we write the ordinance, there will be a mechanism for enforcement. As you say, it's the person that we have enforcing all those different codes. It's you know, it's. Will they get to the restaurants? Will we be able to dedicate time to that? We don't know. There will be a mechanism for that to happen. So if we do see, for example, if there is an establishment that is just not in any way, shape or form complying and with the audience, there will be a process where we can address that with them. So 
So okay. yeah, I, I, I see your point and we'll, we'll make sure that that's addressed. Um, maybe they could tie it to renewing the conditional use permits to operate the facility because that's certainly leverage that they would have. So if they have X number of complaints from the public by the Mike Lindell app or other means uh, that, uh, that that could jeopardize their ability to renew their their um, you know conditional use, use permit and would basically um, put them out of business. So I think that would be one way of getting them to comply without having to take a lot of um, staff time. And so I have seen that in similar. other cities, right? Other cities do connect it to their business permit. Okay. So. Well, they they do that already for the um, the home sharing. So if I wanted to have a Airbnb, you know, mm. I spare room if I <laughs> pretending I had one, and um, the neighbors complained, you know, because they're being noisy or something like that. So if there's a lot of like nuisance complaints, that that you know can keep that person from able to renew their their um, permit to um, share their residence. So so the mechanisms mechanism is already there, so hopefully they can tap into that. Thank you for that. We just have to be careful that it's not just complaints. It's an actual violation. Uh, uh, you know, Rondi, the example you brought up is a good point. What if uh, you have a competing um, Airbnb uh, host and they don't like you, the fact that they have to compete with your facility and they can keep on uh, you know, submitting these bogus complaints and there's X number of complaints. So you lose your ability to have that side business. It shouldn't be just complaints. It should be investigated by, you know, violations, actual violations, not just somebody clicking that many times on the app. So you have 30 complaints because somebody clicked 30 times. Um, oh yeah. Hopefully somebody's following up and making sure they're legitimate. Yes. That sort of thing. Yeah, the, the whatever complaint comes in would have to be verified by city staff. Otherwise, this has no grounds to to say that they're not in compliance. So, so are there are, are there examples with other cities that do have more of a stick with penalties? Like, if there's a business that is just not falling into compliance, and it's been verified by staff that over the last six months, they haven't made any changes despite being warned five times. Like, is there is there a mechanism that uh, imposes a, pe a penalty? They would just follow the, so for us, and Jillian, please correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, so for the first violation, if that's followed up, there'll be a fine or a, a letter stating that you're in violation, followed up by a fine and then a third violation will trigger some other type of action. So, so there is that process. Um, so that's the, the stick is the city's normal violation, complaint violation process that has been adopted. They just jump onto that. Okay, I, I didn't see that in the in the staff report. So is that is that the case, Jillian? With uh, like, does this fall into normal penalty structures or? Well, we have an administrative enforcement process that involves citations, and we also have a criminal enforcement process. It just depends on uh, whether or not um, the violation is classified as a misdemeanor or an infraction. These sound like they are fairly minor act violations in the grand scheme of the sorts of violations that might occur under the municipal code that are may involve sort of more imminent threats. Um, so uh, what we've what we've done over the years is transition away from the criminal law enforcement because um, it does uh, take a lot of court time and uh, we don't get the necessarily the results that we want um, uh, the defendants are given, you know, extensive amounts of time to comply. It may not be the most effective manner of gaining enforcement. So the administration administrative enforcement process was adopted and um, our likely recommendation would be that we roll into that enforcement process where we initially seek, uh, we provide notice, we seek voluntary compliance. 
Um, and uh, we, of course, give people uh, the opportunity to do so, and we follow up. And it is from that perspective that these uh, the reports of these types of violations and the in, uh, inf inspections that are necessary in order to verify are quite time consuming. And you could imagine someone, for example, <laughs> You know, going through the city and and, and uh, phoning in, you know, so to speak, a lot of these violations, maybe up and down Brand Boulevard. Um, this will take some time for purposes of uh, in investigating uh, and providing folks the opportunity to voluntarily comply, to, to generate the written notices, to identify the persons to whom the notices could be sent. So, for example, it's not as straightforward necessarily as a property owner. Or a tenant, uh, where you can do some investigative search and you can fairly quickly determine who owns the property, uh, whether it's corporately owned or owned by a private individual, or whether you're dealing with a tenant and what the situation is. So that's sort of like the traditional property and uh, code enforcement. But here, um, it may not be as straightforward because you may have employees on site. Uh, and you may, so there may be a little bit more investigation involved to find out who is ultimately responsible and who to whom any kind of citation should be issued. So, um, I, that's why I think, uh, so the process is there. I think we'll have to get used to how that can be implemented. Um, but the more important part of it, I, and I think the commissioners have touched on this already is that educational program. And, uh, you know, and, and the uh, voluntary cooperation with moving forward and providing the alternatives and overcoming the objections to the to the rollout of the new regulations. Um, nobody wants to be told what to do, but if they're shown how to do something that may be uh, more desirable in terms of gaining overall compliance and converting the mentality. So it's a two pronged approach. And uh, as David said, we would be using our existing uh, in administrative enforcement processes. We have the option to use uh, criminal or civil enforcement penalties that's already built into our code. Um, so we can come in much stronger if that's necessary, but at the moment, this doesn't seem like the topic where we would employ those, those harsher uh, mechanisms. So hopefully that gives you a little uh, groundwork for you know what we're able to do um, and and how initially we were thinking about uh, moving forward with penalties and and, and remedies and enforcement. Yeah, yes, yeah. so, uh, and uh, I hope my comments weren't didn't come across as me suggesting that we that we move forward with those more punitive. No, it didn't come across that way at okay. all. I mean, you're just trying to understand what our process is and how we would uh, implement it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yes. So I guess so does there need to be I guess the the question becomes what language if any is needed in as part of this ordinance to ensure that those administrative enforcement processes apply for this particular ordinance. It would be a reference to our, our existing administrative enforcement process. Okay. So uh -huh. is that is that included already? David, you're on mute. Um, if we get direction to write an ordinance, it would be included as we develop the ordinance. Yes. So we would include that language. Yeah, um, I would like to move that we um, adopt this um, or make this recommendation to City Council, uh, the you know alternative to to um, to basically limit the use of these um, polystyrene and plastic and with the broadening of the egg cartons to all plastic egg cartons as mentioned and then to add that they use the existing administrative process to enforce it. And, and uh, if you're okay with it, Randy, I would add the, the water bottle restriction for all of events in the city. Or on, on public property? Or or yeah, yeah. Th I, I think what maybe Jillian can help with how this could be worded, but I was imagining that it would apply to events that require a city permit. We would use similar wording as to what we did in the first um, ordinance regarding city facilities, which kind of addresses that. So, yes. 
yes, I'll accept the friendly amendment. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm happy to second that. Um, and I think now is when we would open it for discussion. If people have comments or questions about the motion. And do you have any callers on this item before you uh, go? Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, we do not have callers at this time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. Sure. Uh, okay. Do we have any questions or comments from commissioners before we vote on the item? I'm good. No, thanks. All right. Let's take a roll call. Commissioner Cartunian? Yes. Commissioner Hanjan? Yes. Commissioner Pinkerton? Yes. Vice Chair Werner? Yes. Chair Bartosov? Yes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda under reports and information 6B Earth State 2022 Work Plan Update Report. Um, so we're very grateful we have Elizabeth with us and we threw her in straight into. Um, this project um, and what I've learned from Elizabeth as she's been working on this for the last 10 days is a she did a lot more work than I did in the last three four weeks months even and that this is quite a, um, a logistical um, complexity but I'll let Elizabeth um, pre pre present her staff report yes yeah, so what I thought I'd share today is um, I'll take through an overview of kind of the status of events um, that were provided in previous um, sustainability commission reports and give you an example of how much effort is gone into um, such and has gone into creating um, the event. So I'll just try to share my screen. Okay, cool. Do you see the Earth Day presentation? No. No? Nope. The screen is gray. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me share. Elizabeth, I can share if you want. You just tell me next. Uh, there you go. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, so this report essentially is like going over some of the highlight of a view of events and kind of an example of the logistics and complexities that were involved in planning Earth Day. So, for instance, this was the initial list of Earth Day or Earth Week event ideas that came from, I think, a previous ad hoc committee. So, one was like a collective drive so or, or a collection drive at Glendale Community College where people can bring items that can be recycled or can be, you know, exchanged. There is an idea of a tree planting day, um, an environmental art installation a habitat garden planting event, so something like a pop-up within an open space for the public to kind of understand about our environment, the wildlife, or something from the notes. A pop-up park concept, that's what we've now been calling Earth Day Pop-Up Fair, but something about a reimagining of a space to show, you know, what the city and what different initiatives around the environment, sustainability, and local community events. A community bike day or bike week. A composting and gardening workshop was proposed. A litter cleanup. A legislative day of action from the commission and an environmental film screening. So over the past few day, weeks, couple weeks, 10 days, um, we've narrowed it down to about Four, five items that are potentially in the works for Earth Day event. So the collection drive was discussed as potentially um, to be moved for a next year event if we are to do another Earth Week um, due to not enough time uh, as well to collect enough, you know, to advertise it, put together and get to make this event very special because we probably need to get local groups involved and 
and that would just also have to make, uh, also work with GCC. And there also, we had the pop-up Earth Day Fair confirmed, and these two were planned to be on the same day. We thought they would collide, um, collide with one another. Um, the tree planting day was um, something to be moved for next year, potentially, because of the lack of resources. I contacted our forestry department, and they don't have the staff resources to support such an event, a volunteering tree planting event. What they could do instead is a ceremonial tree planting, which is essentially they basically prep everything. Somebody or a team of execs or VIPs come, maybe say a few words, take a few pictures, shovel a few lumps of dirt, and then their arborists will complete the process. So not very much engaging with the community. Um, an environmental art installation was something to be potentially be considered for next year as well, because the Glendale Library Arts and Cultures are already doing multiple art exhibits that focus on environment and sustainability. So we were thinking, well, why add an additional piece of work when there's already a team doing something very similar and launching exhibitions around the same time as Earth Day? A habitat garden planting pop-up is still unconfirmed. We're still trying to figure out if there's a group who may be interested in doing such a thing. Um, in the notes, a monarch group was suggested, but an I wasn't able to find an organization as such, and I contacted the Monterey Eco Community Garden as an alternative. Um, the one thing that is confirmed as of now is our pop-up park concept, which I renamed the Earth Day Pop-Up Fair, and that's confirmed. There's a location that's been confirmed. We have the, um, we also have a time that we're working with, and we have people and departments who are willing to show up to the fair. It's in the process of, we're in the process of getting permits and as well as confirming additional vendors, which I'll talk about later. But in terms of having a date and location, that's been confirmed and why it's a confirmed main event. The community bike week or bike day, something was like suggested to be like Cyclovia. Um, that was suggested for our next year because in the time to set up permits, to figure out which streets to close, there wasn't enough time to organize and coordinate such a big, you know, event that would that would involve a lot of closure of streets. Um, a composting and gardening workshop was considered um, for next year. Um, there is um, LA compost um, was un unavailable at the time and currently um, the city does not do composting workshops at the time. There's not enough capacity. A litter cleanup is still unconfirmed. We're looking to see if there's partner who's going to have a litter cleanup within the city around the same time, or the alternative is looking at organizing something ourselves from scratch would take a lot of effort, or this could be something that could be for next year. Um, a legislative day of action is unconfirmed because that would be with the Sustainability Commission, and that's something that commissioners would want to probably discuss and on how you want to proceed with that. An environmental film screening is unconfirmed because um, to be able to plan and organize such an event, I need to know what film we wanted to do. And that I think comes from a suggestion from the commissioners. And that reason I need the name of a film is in order to secure the licensing for such a film screening event. Hey. So through this process of just planning Earth Day, most of the efforts have been in the Earth Day pop-up fair, but it's been a great learning experience for us as the office um, and myself as well, is that there's a lot of considerations in planning citywide events, such as like the parking lot pop-up. Um, it involves site maps and logistic plans. You need to also get event and public health permits. So permits from the city, permits from LA County. Um, you need to work with your various event execution partners, both departments and external and that comes with working with local businesses and community groups to participate in these events. And then there's also considerations for advertising and promotion. So if I just take down the like, you know, city manager requirements from just the city and the county. So what goes into a permit? Um, if you haven't applied for a permit before, all permits require site maps, logistic plans, and some permits require extra facilities on site. So for instance, for our Earth Day pop-up fair, we need to have a special events and application permit. So this is allowing us to have permission to have the event. 
um, and also have amplificated sounds. Um, the event location is at parking lot four, which is a city parking lot just off of Maryland and Wilson. Um, and then we need to, and part of that application has site permits and logistics plans. And this image to the right is a sample site plan for the Earth Day pop-up fair that's in the works. Um, we need a community event organizer application from LA Public, LA County Public Health. And this is for having food vendors on site. If we want to have like a pop-up fair and get the community involved, food vendors are a great way to draw people in and help keep them there. Um, but because LA because if people are selling food, um, there are requirements such as having toilets and hand washing stations that need to be considered. Um, there's also filling out an application for them. And then there, and then also as the community event organizer, there's also, we have to manage the applications of any food vendors that are at the event. So each vendor has to fill out an application, which is a community event temporary food facility application that they're gonna be at this event. Um, and then we, as the city, as the event organizer, has to ensure that those applications are submitted to the county in time, along with coordinating the fees for the vendors at the event. So, for instance, at this Earth Day pop-up fair, the city is not charging each vendor to have a booth at this event, but we have to handle the application fees for food vendors to be able to be at the event for the county. <laughs> So there's that kind of consideration, as well as we have to consider where and how do I get hand washing stations and toilets to meet with the criteria for LA County Public Health. Um, and then on the next part is there's also various departments that have to be coordinated in just one event. So we have to work with public works to book the parking lot space for the event. I'm working with parks and recreations and providing tables and chairs. They're also providing a climbing wall and activities for the Earth Day pop-up affair. Um, affair. Getting the climbing wall in, I had to do a site visit and have some site maps for them. The forest department is have to coordinate with the forest department who are providing trees as decoration for the event. And I have to provide a site map for them to show them where their decorative trees can go. Um, I have to work with, we're working with integrated waste management and coordinating trash bins at all at this event. And they're also hoping with other events, but having to coordinate them to ensure that we have enough trash bins and get bins. Um, management services is supporting on the vents application. Then I have to coordinate with city dispatch because we're going to need no parking signs in the parking lot a few days advance and I have to let them know. And upon the arrival of date, they will be ensuring the enforcement of the vent. And then there's also LA County Public Health that needs to be involved just to support the event applications and permits according with them that this event is in line with their policies and code as well as making sure to submit the application in time. And then there's also the external groups that need to be coordinated. So part of the trash bins with integrated waste management is working with Athens Services, who is the hauler for that region and figuring out trash bins and how many are needed for the event. Um, we're bringing in different organizations like the Raw House Institute and coordinating with them their booth and getting them ready to showcase their solar schoolhouse projects with GUSD students. Um, there was an idea of a bicycle repair clinic. So I was trying to find a, bike, a mobile bike clinic and coordinating with them. So I found Bicycle Pit Stop, who's offering to come to the fair to do bike repair services. He will charge, but he's offering at least to come out, not charge us. Um, working with Artsock Market on getting vendors from their market to come so that there's uh, a reason and hub bub in the fair. Then there's also reaching out to various local businesses and vendors who aren't in the arts market to get them to come to the fair. And that's been actually been taking quite a while because you reach out to businesses and most of the time they don't respond. So there's also follow up time for that. And then we've been reaching out to local community groups. So I reached out to like the Glendale Environmental Coalition and Walk by Glendale, for instance. And it's having to follow up with them to see if they want to be at this group. And then we will eventually in the future be trying to coordinate with local business and cycle groups as an instance to help promote the event, especially to bring you know, cycle groups out here to the event so they can come to their bicycle pit stop and hopefully stay around for the market. And then I also have to notify the adjacent businesses around the event to, as a courtesy, but also as a way to tell them that this event is happening. So there's a lot of like little moving parts that are happening in just planning one event. Um, 
But through this process, we've learned a lot of lessons. Um, and I think one of the big lessons is that even though this Earth Day Fair is just one event in a week, it's taken a lot of effort and what would be helpful for next year and making sure that it's probably even runs even better next year is we start to have these plan activities earlier because it's better to you know book your location and book the vendors and book the support. So who's going to provide trash bins and toilets and hand washing stations as soon as you can, because I found that it makes the permit application process easier because a lot of the permit application process requires a site map and figuring out where to place people is really helpful once you know who's going to be there. <laughs> um, and as well as knowing what are the requirements that I need to have there on hand and what are the relevant permits as well. Um, and then it's also learning is that booking vendors and organizations to participate at these fairs, at these events, does kind of have a lead time. So I think I've emailed businesses and I've been like over a week and I haven't heard back and I'm following up. So finding someone to lock down a date has been taking a long time. And this is just one event. Um, so this is kind of, this is the most complex event for Earth Day, but it does kind of provide some insight into that there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of considerations and logistics when planning these public events. Any questions? Uh, the name of the Monarch organization is called Monarch Watch, like www.monarchwatch.com. They mm -hmm. encourage people to establish um, uh, Monarch way stations, as they call them. So when the monarchs migrate, that they have places where they can stop and and uh, munch on milkweed to give them energy to make it to their destination. Um, I, it's based out of state, but I know of people here in Glendale that have these kinds of gardens and so on. So I can put you in touch with individuals who might be willing to represent the organization here, uh, assuming that they're not in a position to fly someone out here for something like this. But I mentioned that. And also okay. the Arts and Culture Commission. Um, I, I remember Arlene Vidor had made an announcement at an earlier meeting, but there's some uh, screenings that they're having uh, with it that have environmental themes. So you might uh, check with what that group is doing. I was trying while you were talking, I was kind of looking online and I was having trouble finding it, but but those are coming up and th th there could be some cross pollination, so to speak, uh, going on there. Hey, thank you. Helpful ideas. Um, hi, Jennifer. Uh, several, excuse me, several comments. Um, maybe we don't need to put such a heavy emphasis on food at each element of the Earth Day because I know that doesn't involve working with LA County and permitting. So, you know, we can do a lot without having food at each site or each function. Um, I, as far as a litter cleanup, Two of us here on the steering committee for the Glendale Environmental Coalition, and I know that group would be happy to be involved in the litter cleanup. Um, um, I, one of my, I have two staff members that conduct compost and vermiculture workshops for City of LA, depending on what date the event is going to be. They might be available because LA is not holding, sanitation in LA is not holding Earth Day this year, so I can check if you'll give me the date. Um, there's a person in Burbank working on a mon Monarch Mile now. I can send you that name because he's probably in contact with the group that Rondi mentioned or other has other local resources. Um, as far as the film festival, I sent David a list of a lot of DVDs that I have with environmental themes. And we hosted internal meetings for City of LA employees for several years where we screened these films and we were told licenses were not necessary for that type of exhibition where there's no admission charge. I obviously will have to get the Glendale City Attorney's input on that, but just wanted to throw that information out there. Thank you. Thank you. If you could send those contacts my way, that'll be helpful. Our Earth Day pop-up fair is planned for April 23rd. Sure, April 23rd. Okay, thanks. Um, I wanted to add a little bit uh, in addition to, of course, thank you for doing all this work. It, it seems like you've been very busy the last 10 days and, and it definitely shows. Um, the 
community gardens, uh, feel free to engage with me directly. I, I help start the community gardens. Um, and I'm not on the steering committee anymore, but I am in touch with them about uh, how they can be involved in Earth Day. Um, Jennifer, they may take you up on that offer for the workshops. Uh, I did reach out to the Master Gardener program to see if they could uh, have somebody uh, facilitate a workshop that the garden can host. So um, we're, we're currently looking for people who are willing to teach the workshop uh, and the garden is willing to host. So um, I don't know how that ties into Earth Day week for the city, but in any case, it can be promoted or cross promoted uh, at the very least. It, it might be, it might fall outside of Earth Week. Um, so definitely engage me. I'm happy to continue those conversations. Um, I don't know if the Verdugo Wash team is still soliciting input from the community, but I would like to see them there if they are still in that outreach phase. Um, I don't want to drag them out if they're if they're done with outreach, but if they're not and they're looking for more input, it would be great to have them there, uh, and particularly in uh, at Lot 4 where they would be downtown. Um, I'm hoping that GWP will be fully engaged in the pop-up day. Um, yes. I think we've done this, this in past meetings, but, you know, GWP has so many programs that touch sustainability, including uh, the demand response programs, uh, things like that, that perhaps they can do some kind of raffle. Like if you sign up for demand response on Earth Day, we'll put you in a raffle to, I don't know what, you know, they can figure out what they can do with their budget. but. Um, hopefully to, to draw the crowd and encourage people in the community to sign up for those programs that are available to them that are, that specifically touch inability and things they can do in the home. Um, and then <clears throat> I noticed the food trucks. Um, food trucks have been on my mind because not far from where I live, there are two food trucks that have set up shop that are 24 seven or the time that they're there, they're, they're running their gas generators. So I'm hoping that we can find environmentally friendly food trucks that can hook up to electricity. Hopefully there's electricity on site um, or they use solar panels or, or something, but you know, hopefully they're, they're food trucks that aren't using generators um, and are serving sustainable more sustainably friendly food like vegetarian or vegan uh, food trucks. Um, and then uh, definitely uh, use me as your contact for Walk Back Glendale as well. <laughs> I, I work with that. So, so the, the, anything with the community gardens or Walk Back Glendale, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and then I think I had, I thought I had another thought, but I've lost it. Um, if somebody else wants to jump in. Great, thank you. We'll do, we'll reach out to both of you individually regarding your contacts and suggestions. Oh, oh uh, no problem. The other piece was the habitat garden. So the, I think the community garden will be willing to host the planting of a garden. But I, I think what they might be leaning on the city to do is provide the plant materials. And, you know, ideally, I don't know if there's staff ability to do this, but some kind of landscape architect to help determine what that landscape could look like. So it could be a volunteer effort where our, the community comes together to do the actual planting. but. I imagine that we would rely on the city to provide the plants and and hopefully some design assistance. So maybe that's something that could be done within the next month, maybe not, but um, the, the community gardens can definitely like physically host that garden if it were to materialize. Okay, that's an interesting suggestion. <laughs> Uh, cool. I think that's, I believe that's it for me. Other than that, thank you very much for, for working on this so diligently. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, 
That's why we're so grateful to have Elizabeth to, to help us be much more proactive as a department and like, get a lot more stuff done. So, yeah, I'm delighted she's on board. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, it's safe to say David is very happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and I, I will say uh, I, I'm very excited about the placement of lot of the event being at lot four. Um, I do walk to that general area on a daily basis to go to the gym. Um, so if you end up using physical flyers to promote uh, whether it's Earth Day pop-ups specifically or just Earth Day activities in general, um, and you can provide me a flyer as soon as possible, I'm happy to promote on the ground. So um, I, I invite all the commissioners to join me in, in doing our respective neighborhood outreach. Uh, we, can, we can touch folks that you know don't get the city newsletter, perhaps are not following the city on social media, uh, but would definitely see a flyer that's on their car or at their doorstep. Um, so I, I, I ask that you guys join me in doing that, and hopefully the city can get us a flyer to distribute. Definitely. We can e I email you all out a copy of a flyer. We have plans to have a flyer made within the next week, potentially next week, have that start being designed as date as events are confirmed um we are also part of one of the from previous meetings one of the principles for earth day was regarding literature was to ask everyone who participates in earth day to not pass out flyers and to try to use digital code so i guess i just want to remind commissioners that that is a principle that was discussed at previous meetings and so try to use digital mate if you do try to use more digital means of, you know, advertisement. But of course, please feel free to print out in case for people who do not have, you know, mobile uh, internet access. Yes, uh, that's- also that's... use Nextdoor, you know, you can um, post it as an event, you know, in the events column on your Nextdoor site. And we can, you know, that you can post out to thousands of people. So we could probably cover a good part of the city just from people on this commission posting. Yeah, and that's a good point, and that, that was one of the things that we had come up with as a commission. I, I think the intent of that was that we don't want to invite vendors that are simply handing out pamphlets and, and calling it an Earth Day celebration. Um, but I, I do acknowledge that the, the, the piece to promote the event might have to be on paper simply because we're not reaching everybody through digital means. So, you know, I, I'm hoping that the city has access to 100% recycled paper and we can print a few of these to distribute in the local community um, and discourage vendors from attending simply for the purpose of distributing pamphlets. Um, th that was at least my intent with my previous comments about literature. Great. Um, and yes, every vendor that has agreed to come to our event, I've notified them to ask them not to pass out brochures and to think of more creative and digital means um, when trying to have a stand as long as well as not encouraging them to not pass out plastic objects. And if they do decide to have objects at their booth or at the event to use more reusable giveaways or environmentally friendly ones. So all the vendors are being sent those principles and asked to consider how how what they bring to each event pass out. Great. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other comments or questions from the commission? All right. Well, on behalf of the commission, thank you so much for for doing all this hard work. We're we're looking forward to an exciting Earth, Earth Day round of activities. Thank you, my pleasure. All right, uh, shall we move on to the next item? Next item on the agenda, item number seven, sustainability office update. 
7A Climate Action and Adaptation Plan update. Thank you, Vlad. Um, thank you, Commissioners. And before I talk about the CWAP, um, just a couple of, um, believe it or not, it is time to restart our student selection process. Um, so I don't know whether the Commission wants to form the same process as did last time, get the ad hoc committee together um, to do the student selection and interviews, but um, we do want to start that process probably March, April, while the students are still in school and a college so we can reach out to them and then go through the process of interviewing them and selecting them over the summer so that they would begin roughly September when our current um, crop of students began to. So, so yes, so we, we need to start that process. I just want to make sure the Commission was aware of that. Um, we have a, an exciting project that we're doing with <coughs> Glendale Community College. Um, that is centered around the Climate Action Adaptation Plan. Um, I think as we mentioned to you in a previous presentation about the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, um, equity um, is gonna be a key component of that plan. And um, in terms of equity, we're very much concerned about making sure that when it comes to um, community engagement, that we are engaging with all, um, all of the Glendale um, community. So we are working with Glendale Community College, a group of 22 students who um, are doing this as part of an internship with the city um, to follow um, human-centered design principles and guidelines. And we've issued them a challenge statement and they're going to work on this challenge statement to be able to provide us um, solutions of how we will engage um, all in Glendale. So our challenge statement to your students was, how might the city of Glendale encourage underrepresented voices to engage in and remain engaged in sustainability initiatives? Um, so we had our first meeting with them on Tuesday to discuss the challenge statement. And within that meeting, students began to come up with some wonderful suggestions and ideas of how we can engage and keep that community engaged. We're going to have another meeting with them in April um, when they're going to show us some of the solutions to that problem. But the end result is um, the work that these students do and happen to solve this problem, we're going to pass that on to our consultants once selected. So to make sure that they, in their outreach activities, that they outreach all the community of Glendale. So I think that's like really quite an exciting project within the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. As regards the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, um, we've gone through a number of internal revisions and what came back to me was that um, the way the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan was written, it was overcomplicated in some areas and not that clear and we wouldn't get the best um, results from consultants um, responding to the request for proposal. So we've made some, <laughs> some quite large amendments and changes um, to the language in the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, and that is being reviewed right now. So hopefully that process will come to an end um, fairly soon. So there has been a delay, um, but I think it's a good delay because the comments and suggestions we got back from the internal review team was that um, it's good, but it, it could be better in terms of what you're trying to get out of consultants. So that's been a worthwhile process um, we have gone through. In terms of um, future items regarding sustainability going to City Council, we reviewed the City Council forecast out to April 12th, which is what we have information on so far. So the two big items that potentially are going through is on March 22nd, which will be the single use plastics on which we discussed today. And um, finally, the building electrification report will be going to City Council on March 22nd too. Um, so I know the, the Commission is very interested in the future council agenda items so they have the opportunity to discuss those within their meetings. Um, as we get more future dates further out, um, I'll bring that out with the chair as we begin to create the agenda for the April 
um, commission meeting. So that's a report from the Sustainability Office. Thank you, David. Um, uh, with respect to the Climate Action Plan, uh, uh, unfortunate about the delay, I'm, I'm more curious about what, uh, what changes were made that would be of interest to us. I know in the past we've made comments about what should be in the RFP or what should be comprised of the Climate Action Plan. So I guess I'm curious with those drastic changes that were made as a result of internal discussions, would any Sorry. of those be of interest to us? Sure. I'm, I'm more than happy to send the RFP, the revised RFP, to the Commission for review. Um, the actual content of what we're asking the consultants to provide us, which is what we reviewed at the Commission, something that hasn't changed as much as the way the language we are using to ask them to provide this information. So the, the feedback we got was, what we can see what you're asking for, but, it, but it's very unclear, and we don't think that you're going to get the best responses to the asks of the task items. So that's where the, it's, it's been, in some areas, quite a drastic change in the language. The content is still the same, and the objectives are still the same, but we've written it better to make sure that those objectives are met. So, but more than happy to share the revisions with the commission. Okay, yeah, no, that's that's uh, reassuring. Um, so thank you for that. And then as far as the uh, building electrification goes, I know that uh, the consultants, I, I guess, that the city had hired had given us that presentation in recent months um i don't remember that we gave a recommendation or it was a information only item uh so what it, what is it that is going to council for consideration exactly so thank you for that question chairman buttress um so the presentation that was made to the sustainability commission was through the building decarbonization coalition and the local energy codes team um, the local energy codes team are the body that does the cost effectiveness study to determine whether it's applicable for the city to go ahead and look at writing and adopting a reach code. So that analysis um, showed that it potentially was an option for us to go forward. When last time we came in front of the Sustainability Commission, it was to hire, help hire a consultant to help the city develop and write the REACH code ordinance, do the outreach to um, the architectural business building community, to look at language in the REACH code regarding solar ordinances that would be part of the REACH code, and also to look at any EV charging issues that would also be part of the REACH code. So the recommendation from the Sustainability Commission was that, yes, we go ahead and ask City Council um, to provide staff direction to hire a consultant to finish off the process of writing the ordinance, the REACH code, helping us manage that process through the relevant legislative, through the relevant um, California bodies, the California Energy Commission, and or that's associated with that process. Okay, so the, the item going to council is to to essentially hire that consultant? Correct. Got it, okay. Cool, thank you very much. Um, uh, any commissioners have questions or comments? Uh, uh, go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I went to the Arbor Day but they were packing up at the time I got there, and I noticed on the program a familiar name. Uh, uh, Mr. Jones uh, apparently spoke, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were on the uh, Arbor Day event. I, I, I thought the event was very nice, and I recognize uh, Chairperson Bartrisou from Vice Chairperson Werner um, purchased trees, so um, thank you for, for, for doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, we... Um, <clears throat> So I gave a, I gave a presentation 
um, talking about the importance of trees in our sustainability program. And um, I will also address within that presentation the recent IPCC report and where we are in this climate crisis and that uh, we need all tools available to us, such as our community forests, to help us begin to adapt to and prepare for climate action. But it was it was a very nice event, very well received. And it was my first one. I didn't realize the game for, like, for a number of years, like 37 years, I guess, that's been going for. So, um, yeah, that was a nice event. Not sure my speech went over that well. <laughs> it was a nice event. <laughs> I'm sure it did. You're being modest. But um, yes, the event didn't happen last year because of COVID, or at least it was virtual. But um, yeah, I hope that. Um, I, I heard that they got um, many more tree donations than last year. I like to think 52 tree donations, which I'm very happy about. Yeah, that, that's probably a record. So mm -hmm. I like to think had something to do with the announcement <laughs> <laughs> in your last month's meeting, but who knows? But um, but it's a great program and and a great way to honor somebody that, that you know to to Absolutely. get a tree in their name. Thank you. I actually, uh, on on that note, I, I I thought of Glendale Beautiful, which is the nonprofit that has been kind of spearheading Arbor Day with the city of Glendale. Um, when we were doing the commendation with the Clark students, I, I I don't know what the procedure is for doing additional commendations as a commission. Uh, perhaps David, you and I can talk about it offline, but. Um, they would be an excellent organization that I think the commission can highlight and celebrate, um, especially it's timely now that they they did do that uh, event this week um, and they're pursuit they're they're gearing up for Arbor Day, so, um, so just something to think about. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's to be formally agendized, but um, maybe I can talk with staff offline about future accommodations. Great. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? Yes, um, David and fellow commissioners. Uh, in terms of the selection of next year's ex officio members, the student members, I want to give an opportunity to the current ex officio members uh, to tell us, you know, how can we improve the process? What was their experience like? Um, uh, you know, if you don't mind, Andrea and Henry. Um, is there anything that we can improve on um, from from the your selection process experience and your participation in in you know the past several months? Yeah, I'll say a few words. Um, so far, my experience has been really unique. Actually, I'm not that well versed in policy. Um, in regards to, you know, all of the ordinances that we've talked about and, you know, the pro proposed projects that have been discussed. Um, so, you know, giving like a 101 of a few of the things that um, of the ordinances and things like that. Um, I had to do a lot of Googling <laughs> um, to, you know, understand a little bit more. So um, I would say maybe discuss that with the the incoming students for next year. Um, because, you know, it, it did take me a little bit to kind of dissect everything and, um, read through things. So, um, that that's been my experience so far, you know, just a little bit of a vocab kind of thing where, you know, you go over a few of the terms that we just, you know, discuss most often. Um, but, but no, I think it's, um, so far the selection process was fairly gone fairly smooth. I think, um, you know, uh, whoever you guys, whoever the ad hoc committee decides to choose will do a great job as well. Andrea, based on your experience, is there anything that we can do differently to recruit, to reach more students? Um, mm, I would say publicize a little bit more outreach, um, you know, maybe at schools. Um, I don't know if this is the case for Henry, but, you know, at, you know, different high schools or um, even GCC, um, you know, things like that outreach. How did you, if you don't mind me asking, how did you hear about the uh, opportunity? Was it through a counselor? Was it through a billboard? How was it? Um, if I remember correctly, it was through the Glendale website, the city website. Okay. Um, yeah, not through your school. Message. No, <laughs> okay. no, not through my school, no. 
Good to know. Henry? Uh, yeah, I'd like to add on to what Andrea said about there being a significant learning curve. I think that uh, for the most part, it was me just trying to keep up with everything that was going on. And I think for a few years, it'd be cool to just ask the commissioner just to say one thing at least. Because I know for me, like I was thinking and debating internally if I should say this or not. And it was just like, if you just told me to do it, I, would, I think it would have been a lot easier because it was our first time doing this kind of thing. And just taking that first step and being open is harder than it seems. And so I think that doing that with the new commissioners would be a really cool thing to do. And on top of that, having like a one-on-one, -on -one, like Andrea said, just before the meetings actually start, just to get them well-versed in the vocab and just how the commission works and what they can do and bringing information and maybe new ideas to the commission itself would be something that would be really helpful in the long run. So like maybe a student commissioner orientation that was like, you know, more suited for them. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. At, at the end, like when we, like we have the sustainability officer comments, maybe there's a student commissioner comments uh, part of the agenda or something just to, because I, I did notice uh, both of you were a little bit uh, reluctant to speak up a lot. And, and I remember last month I even called on you guys. I was like, do you have anything to say about the power plant? So, so I, I, um, I know it's intimidating, but I think if we scheduled it and then you knew that, you know, you'd have a few minutes at some point in the, in the program that that would help you get comfortable with speaking during the, mm -hmm. the commission meetings. Yeah. And that'd be a lot helpful because it was just kind of hard to determine, you know, the validity of what we're even going to say, if it's right or not. And just like having that opportunity just, Put it all out there would be really helpful. Henry, same question to you that I asked Andrea. Is there anything we could do differently to recruit and reach the maximum number of students? Uh, I think you should definitely reach out to the counselors because I only got like a really vague email from this one specific teacher that I was part of with this one specific club that I am no longer part of. And it's like if I wasn't in that club originally, I would have never even gotten this email. And so I think that you should just ask the teachers or the administrators to send out like a school-wide email. I think that'd be a lot more helpful in reaching the most people that you can. Yeah, okay. I think it could also count towards like the community service um, hours that are required from different schools. Um, you know, something something along those lines of having, you know, be incentivized somehow, <laughs> you know. Good to know. Thank you very much. Do you have a, an email for someone that is, you know, at your school at least, uh, who handles those kinds of communications to the students? Because it sounds like we need a list of those if the city doesn't already have one. Maybe they do, but is there a list of uh, school contacts for community announcements? Uh, yeah, so at my school specifically, there's just one lady who's, I think, part of the assistant principal's office and I think she's a secretary for them and she just sends out like the school wide email blasts every week. And I don't recall her exact email, but I'm sure if you go on to like a website for like Hoover or GHS or CV, it'll say like the main secretary administrator who sends out those blasts. And I think it'd be really easy to just locate that information. And if not, you can just contact any one of the counselors and I'm sure they'll point you in the right direction. Or maybe the um, education, uh, there's a um, the pu public school board, there's a, what, what do you call it, the, um, um, the uh, Glendale Unified School Board, maybe? Yeah, yeah, and if you, because uh, I think it's more specific to schools and it'd be easier to reach the, the students through the school instead of to the district, because I know I don't really get a lot of district info, it's all like school specific, and I think doing that would be much better. Yeah, uh, David, correct me if I'm wrong. Last time uh, we did this, we went through the district, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, and it, it, there seems to be a disconnect by the time we send it to the district and uh, it trickles down to the, you know, the individual schools and the students, uh, sometimes the message get lost. So it looks like we need to do some legwork an outreach for different schools. Yeah, that's correct, Commissioner Cartini. And we reached out to the district. We asked them to provide us 
um, the principals of the different schools, and then we sent an email to the principals of the schools, um, plus we did promotions through the website, the newsletter. Um, but you can see we, we need to, um, I think um, Elizabeth has already started working on that issue for us too, so. I, it, it sounds like you're jockeying to be on the ad hoc committee. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, <laughs> if anything, if anything, though, Chair, um, um, maybe to take some uh, burden off the staff, um, if we are going to publicize it, uh, we can each take one high school, uh, and you know we'll reach out to that high school. We'll be we'll answer their questions. Um, we'll follow up with the assistant principal or whoever secretary. Uh, in the old days, when I went to Glendale High, uh, I was responsible to edit the daily. Uh, there was a daily bulletin that gets uh, uh, that used to get uh, distributed to the um, uh, to the homerooms. I don't. I'm pretty sure that doesn't uh, exist anymore. But uh, something similar to that. I'm dating myself here. Uh, but there was a daily bulletin at that time. Uh, uh, sh surely uh, we can do it if we divide it up. Uh, each of us can take one high school. Sign me up for Clark. <laughs> I guess I'll have to take on the high school, my alma mater. Um, okay. Any... Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just say, has anyone gone to CV or Hoover? Silence here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. um, so do so do we, uh, David? Do you need direction from us on this item, or is it just something that we should be mindful of uh, in the coming months? Something that we should be mindful of, and we'll probably get it on the agenda officially for the next meeting, so you can establish the ad hoc committee, um, and then we'll start going through the process that's suggested here today about getting the commissioners to reach out to the different schools, getting the contacts. So it's officially agendized for future meeting. Yeah. Okay, great. So we, we can uh, between now and then how we want that to look yeah. like. Ike, you bring up excellent points about us doing our own individual um, outreach when, when the time comes. So uh, I'm happy to do my part and reach out to Clark. And um, I know a school board member that would probably help with social media outreach. And you know, we all have our individual contacts, and we can we can push it out. Um, and, and hopefully get a better turnout uh, with this next process. I think. I think to be fair, um, uh, David, we should still notify the district because the last thing I want is the the district saying, you know, um, you contacted the high school and the district was not aware that you're doing this. We should notify the district, uh, you know, just like before, but let them know that the commission will be reaching out to individual schools. Because the process last time did not work, apparently. Now, and, and to that point, um, Commissioner Cartinian, um, the city now is has been invited and sits on the Glendale Unified School District Sustainability Commission. So um, we can bring it up at that next meeting to make sure they're on there. And we, we didn't have that inroads last time. So continuing improvement, sir. <laughs> Yes, I think uh, sending something out to principals when I can imagine they have so much on their plate uh, that that's probably a little bit of a bottleneck there, just trying to get past them and, and you know, in front of the students. Of course, the pandemic didn't help. They were dealing with, you know, distance learning and person learning. You know, they had, you know, bigger things going on, I'm sure, at the time. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, any other comments before we adjourn? Um, okay, let's uh, move on to the next item, which I think is adjournment, right? Item number eight, adjournment. May I please have a motion and second? Oh, well, can I mention one little thing first? <laughs> I did find the thing I was trying to find on the Arts and Culture Commission that was uh, sustainability related. Um, it's a um, actually, an, an exhibit. I said 
uh, screening but it's an exhibit it's called impending storms and it's at the the central library it's going on now um oh no it start, opens tomorrow and it goes through may 1st and it will put a spotlight on the reality of the dangers of significant loss of species and biodiversity. So I think it's um, very apropos to what we're doing here. So I hope everyone has a chance to catch that. Thank you for that reminder. Um, all right, uh, who wants to make the motion? So moved. I'll second it. And we're <laughs> 8.46 p.m. Have a great night, everyone.